Mike Heiser is a scholar in the fields of biblical studies and the ancient Near East. He is currently the academic editor for Logos Bible Software in Bellingham, Washington, and served at, uh, serves rather as an adjunct professor at three colleges and universities. Mike has a Ph.D. in Hebrew and ancient Semitic languages, along with two master's degrees in biblical studies and ancient history. In 2005, he was named one of Fate's, uh, Fate Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in Ufology. Wish I'd seen that list. Mike is a well-known critic of ancient astronaut beliefs and for having the majestic documents tested by a computational linguist for authenticity. He is also known for his supernatural thriller, The Facade, which focuses on how an E.T. disclosure might impact traditional religious beliefs. Oh, we're going to have fun with that tonight. And how the alien question might be related to ancient texts, including, of course, the Bible. Mike, welcome to Dark Matter. Boy, Art, thanks for having me on. I, I just have to say, listening to you read the news is like listening to Vin Scully call a baseball game. <laughs> really? It's just, oh, yeah. I mean, I, I'm just, i got to take a breath here. I don't want to sound like too much of a fanboy, but I, I'm just thrilled that you're back on the air. I don't know how you waited this long uh, to come back, because it sounds like you just love it. Well, it's called a non-compete, Mike. <laughs> oh man, that would I would have just been pulling my hair out. <laughs> uh, what little I have left, yes. Oh, um, it's great to hear you. Well, thank you. I've never been um I've never received a compliment for just reading the news. I thought that was Oh, sort of, it's I don't know. It's, I, I have hackles too, you know, at the at your introduction, you know, your What music part really got you? The uh, the eating of the hearts, was it? No, or? no, 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 no. No. <laughs> Oh, it's just it's just rhythmic, you know. It uh, you know just taking simple headlines, and it's just it's Art Bell reading the news. You know, you could just go sort of sit there and listen to it for hours. Hmm. You know? uh, well, <laughs> okay. It just brings uh, back great great memories, you know, for me. Because I I listened to you, you know, for years while I was in grad school, all by myself. I'm I'm holed up as a security guard in my little shack, or the genetics lab that I had to guard, and I'm listening to Art Bell. You know, every, I know you mean that like in, the, the, in the very yeah. I know you mean that in like the very best way. But oh, um, great. <laughs> I know, but it makes me feel old. <laughs> well, I'm 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 as old, you know, the X number of years removed, you know, as you are. But it's just great to hear you again. All right. Well, then listen to this, Mike, and then we'll come right back to you, Mr. Bell. This is an email. I'm so glad you're back on Sirius XM. Discovered your show about 15 years ago on a regular radio by accident. Enjoyed it very much. Get this, folks. I had originally heard your show on the island of Okinawa when I was a nine-year-old kid, and we lived in Naha. <laughs> My dad was a pilot in Vietnam. We were stationed on the rock. And you introduced me to the uh, rock and roll music. became such a big part of my life. You were the first DJ... I remember, and I had my little transistor radio I listened to with a single earpiece. <laughs> yeah, he, they refer to a, um, something I did when I was there. I was on a teeter-totter in a contest with a couple of Marines. I, I had a Navy guy as partner, and we were up against two Marines. And we went for um, 57 hours. Something like that. Anyway, he ends the email. Remember now, he, he first heard me when he was nine years old. I'm 56 now, Art, and will always have a special place for Art Bell in my heart and mind. <laughs> You're my Wolfman, Jack. 50, 56 years old now, and and this person first heard me when they were nine. See? It's right, wow. What you said is right down that alley. Well, it's not quite that, that far, but... Uh... That's, that's pretty impressive. At least you didn't hear me when you were nine. All right, let's get started. Uh, I want to talk about ufology. I mean, did you hear the first story that I read about the Roswell? Uh, have you heard these rumors? Oh, yeah, I, I've, I've heard them, and I've read, uh, 
the shall I'll be charitable here the conflicting accounts of the uh, story of the the photos surfacing and boy this is just gonna there's gonna be a big fight I mean it's already been a big fight but it's gonna be a big fight um what would you say Mike, uh, this is just a sort of a, a what if, but if they released these Roswell photographs, they were authenticated, and it was proven that we were visited by these creatures that, you know, who knows, probably were at Area 51 for a while or disposed of in some manner or are still alive, whatever. In other words, real creatures, if it's proven, mm -hmm. what will you say? Well, I would say I'm not terribly surprised. Um, you know, personally, I, I don't have any. Really? Yeah, I, really. I don't really have any. I don't really have any difficulty, you know, theologically or religiously. But I, on the heels of that, you know, that's me talking. I mean, I, I can say, well, I'm not real surprised. You know that. You know, given this or that, that you know, it's not really too much of a stretch. I mean, I look at it as as an academic. I and as an academic, I know that this question has been around literally, you know, for two thousand years. It goes all the way back to Aristotle. You know, before this is pre-Christian. Are there other worlds? I mean, everybody's been talking about this for millennia. It's only really been recently that it's just become this scary thing you know for religious people so i i would try to you know, get people to pay attention to the conversation that's been happening for so long and say look you know this i mean it's a big deal because it is you know now we have you know evidence of this but as far as the discussion i mean this you know sort of just falls right into place you know then the questions change you know, they become different it's not are we alone or or not you know then it's like well what does this mean you know what where do they come from are there others and all this sort of thing i i'm i'd like to live you know in in the star trek world you know where there's life you know elsewhere and so on and so forth i mean i i just i'm known for just asking what i think are reasonable questions about evidence and things like that but if we ever had it uh i wouldn't be unenthusiastic about it at all but that's me you know i don't don't you, I don't think, don't my, you think uh mike don't you think that um in this era of discovering suddenly hundreds and hundreds of exoplanets you know planets that are Mm -hmm. like Earth that could conceivably support life. That's a major discovery, you've got to admit, in terms of the probability of life being discovered. Yeah, I, I think those kind of finds are better than something like the Drake equation. I, I tend to be in, in the crowd that has a fairly low view of the Drake equation because I don't know. Explain, how explain for everybody the Drake equation, please. Well, this is Frank Drake, the astronomer, came up with a famous equation that tried to articulate the probability of life existing elsewhere. And and that's a worthy thing to attempt. The problem with the Drake equation is that every point of the equation was made up. In other words, there wasn't any data for it. Now, that's why I say this kind of thing. When we actually are starting to get data, there's X number of planets now that, you know, to the best of our scientific ability, will support life. That starts to fill in some of those gaps. And so when I think probability, if someone's talking to me about the Drake equation, it's like whatever. But if they're talking about discoveries like this, to me that helps. Uh, okay, so the, the last five years of the discovery of these exoplanets changes the equation? Well, I, if, if you're if you're making a pun there, yes. Uh, sort uh, of, yeah. If you, yeah, I would say yeah. It, it it changes the conversation in in this way. I think the conversation on probability actually becomes more data driven than a you know sort of a a contrived equation. I, and I don't want to say contrived there in a, in a negative sort of way, but you know because I think it, it's it's worth trying to speculate, but it. You know, without data, that's what you've got. You've got speculation. And I think it's a reasonable uh, conclusion uh, if it becomes a more reasonable conclusion, let's put it that way, if we have, you know, evidence that there are other places that, 
again, life as we know it could be sustained. It doesn't prove anything, but it does mm-hmm. make the probability reasonable. And I would for me, it, it gets it on the table. You know, if, if we didn't have any sort of planet other than Earth that we could talk about in these terms, and, you're, and then we're going to have this probability discussion. Without that, it, to me, it doesn't even really deserve to get on the table. Well, that's now that you we're have just looking this, at if we're you know. just looking at, at little dots of light and saying, man, yeah. it would be a great waste of space if you know if there weren't. Uh, yeah, that, that's to, an emotional argument, you know. Yep. And, but I, I'd rather have data than. I don't want to sound cold here, but I'd rather have data than the the emotional argument. All right. Well, we're we're beginning to get that data, and uh, with those planets, um, for example, I had somebody from SETI on, Seth Shostak from SETI, and Mm -hmm. um, you know they haven't heard anything yet, Mike. But it occurs to me that if there's all these exoplanets that that are like Earth, capable of sustaining life, why do we suppose that life would evolve? No, 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 the way we have technologically and even have radio or TV or even imagine it. I, I think that's a, a reasonable question to ask, and I, I've, I've wondered that myself. And you and I aren't alone there. I mean, there are, there are criticisms of SETI in that regard that why aren't you using a different strategy, um, you know, to, to look for this or that. So, you know, the, the truth is the... The blunt truth is we don't really have any reason to make that assumption that they would be communicating the same way. But the reality is that's what's within our reach. And, you know, it's a funding issue. It's a technology issue. You know, it's a it's a garnering enough interest, you know, to get people to care issue. You know, all those things are part of the discussion. You would describe yourself how? As a skeptic? I would describe myself as someone who, again, would would like these things to be true, but I want there to be real evidence for it. I'm, I'm not impressed with with anecdotes. I'm not impressed with emotional arguments. I I just like to know. And and when I say I I believe or think X, I'd like to have something concrete to sort of base that on to to, to fall back on. So with some people that makes me a skeptic. With other people, uh, especially, you know, in, in the more fundamentalistic wing of, of Christianity, what I've already said tonight is just awful, you know, because there's this tendency to equate the whole question of, of extraterrestrial life with one of two things, mm-hmm. and probably both, and that is the demonic realm, and then, well, you must, you know, buy into Darwinian evolution. And, and I'll, con- I'll confess, I'm not really disturbed by evolution. Uh, I don't really like materialistic Darwinism, but that's not the same as the idea of evolution. Are you convinced uh, by, are, are you convinced of evolution, Mike? Yeah, I think evolution is is a reality. Uh, the, the question in my mind, there are questions in my mind like uh, to what extent, what mechanisms did it need? Uh, you know, I, I'm sort of at, at an advantage here because when I was in graduate school, the place where I went to church, was heavily, heavily populated by professors from the hard sciences at the university there, the University of Wisconsin. Right. We had the head of environmental studies. We had the head of botany. We had two research physicists. We had a geologist. We had a professor of electrical engineering. We had another one in chemistry. I mean, the people like me in the humanities were, were like, completely outnumbered and all of them were very serious you know about their their faith their theological commitments and every one of them accepted the idea that well evolution that's how god did it no kidding what it's a no-brainer uh they they, they just didn't flinch about it it was it was not (laughs) trying to start a conversation with you know with them well what do you think about people who you know might be here even in our in our church or some colleague you have somewhere or some acquaintance that don't agree it to them it, it was just it wasn't even a, a sensible question to ask but yet they were very serious well i i sort of i spent nine years in that environment and so i just have to chuckle you know when i read things or hear things about how this is sort of an all or nothing proposition you know, or, you know we either have to accept this or that the bible or evolution there's no in between it it's like I just know better. I know intellectually better because I read lots of stuff, but I know by experience as well uh, that these are not mutually exclusive things. And so you know, I'm not a scientist. I have to depend on scientists to sift arguments for me. I read things that, that I appreciate 
you know, on evolution, I read, you know, there's a lot of debate within the hard sciences about evolution. Isn't they, evolution just easily, don't all agree. Isn't, right. Isn't it easily said, uh, Mike, that, you know, God may have started the process of evolution, and that sort of cleans it all up right there? Yeah, and that, and that's where most of these guys were. I mean, uh, I think there were, there may have been one or two that would would be willing to to say it was sort of you know random. In, in other words, when you when you take that position that you just articulated that God started the process, that involves a deliberate decision. You're speaking of God as a person, you know, with uh, making you know, intelligent decisions and whatnot, and that's the common view uh, for people who are in the scientists who happen to be Christians who accept evolution. There might have been one or two of these of these people that I knew that would have taken a step back even from that and and made it a little more random, closer to what you would think of as a a secular Darwin position. They they were so, somewhere in between there. But I agree with you. I, I think that 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 idea and then that the sub question is tell me why God couldn't make that decision. You know, tell me Right, he, exactly. He you know, how on on what basis would you say that God is limited and kept from making that decision? And to me, that just kills the conversation. But you know, again, that that's me. So I I'm not troubled by the idea that if if there is this thing, this force of nature, you know, and in God's hand, you know, some providential thing. Uh, that we call evolution, you know, maybe life evolved somewhere else. And it, then, then the discussion changes to, well, what, you know, would God have a purpose in that? What would the point be? Uh, what's the relationship between that and us? And, you know, you get in a whole, a number of layers of other questions, but uh, I don't think the discussion needs to stop with the first question, you know, about or we, probability we simply and evolution. Could have, uh, it simply could have evolved from stardust. I mean, Basically, stardust, mud puddles, lightning strikes, you name it, right? Yeah, I mean, see that, now that is an issue because okay. if, if I were to, if I were to say that to, again, to one of my friends, you know, Professor So and So, he would yes. say, oh, whatever. But someone who's sort of been trained, uh, to think that, well, the reason, you know, Art Bell is suggesting that, or the reason someone you know, is saying that is because they want me to accept the idea that, you know, I'm an extraterrestrial or extraterrestrials are our space brothers. And in other words, they, because they've sort oh. of been conditioned to respond a certain way, they, you know, unfortunately will. They won't really stop to think, well, there's, there's two or three or four or ten different ways to sort of look at this. And they'll, they'll kind of gravitate to the one they really dislike. You know, and then, you know, it becomes a real thing to fight over. Hmm. All right. Um, so you, with regard to extraterrestrials, you're not married to the idea. Uh, no, I... I nor, nor, nor are yeah. you uh, that distant from it that you can't embrace the possibility. No, I, I, I like I said, I, I love, I have this, again, this romantic spasm in me that, boy, wouldn't it be nice if Star Trek were real, you know, minus the Klingons and the Romulans, I guess. But, you know, that, that would be really interesting. It'd be fascinating. It's sort of on my short list of, boy, wouldn't I like to see this before I die, you know, that kind of thing. Oh, but on the other side, yeah, well, I, I have things like let's clone a mammoth and all that kind of stuff. I mean, there are just some things I'd love to see them do. And, and again, this is on the list, too, I'd like to know. But on the other side, I don't think we really have evidence yet. You know, a, a lot of what people accept as evidence, I just don't think is really good evidence. And so I, I sort of suspend it and, like, hope. But because I hope one direction doesn't mean I'm going to embrace what I think is a really bad argument. Or okay, so the people who would ask you to direction. accept the evidence, uh, Mike, uh, or the I should say, preponderance of the evidence. When you look back at all the UFO sightings, when you look, you know, all the stories, they claim it all adds up to, it's got to be true. Yeah, they they do claim that, and that that's the part I have difficulty with. I don't think it adds up to that at all. Okay. Uh, what for? Ask yourself this question: Why do we? With the whole UFO thing, why do we think about UFOs and think extraterrestrial? Mm. What well, do you think most in, people in, would in, say? in my case, Mike, uh, I had a sighting, right? right? A very close sighting, a very convincing sighting. 
Uh, I could have thrown a rock at the damn thing. It floated over my head, or more likely defied gravity, and then I watched it float out across the valley uh, with my mm -hmm. wife at that time. And uh, once you've seen something like that, then, yes, you begin to ask questions like the ones you were just talking about. Right. Now, if I saw, and you're referring to the triangle, I remember yes. you know, you, yes. you talking about that on the air at length. If I saw one of those, I would. my first thought would be either let's get in the house <laughs> or, boy, that's really cool. But I've read in, 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 the, this sort of technology, especially the slow-moving ones, is really on the board, on, on – in patents, I mean, I actually blog about this stuff, you know, with, with some frequency, back into the 20s and 30s. In other words, you could have seen a dirigible or a dirigible married to nuclear power. It's harder to, to talk dirigible when they make, you know, when they go real fast and make turns and all this sort of thing. But what I'm getting to is, is you think extraterrestrial because of it, because it's an unfamiliar technology. Right. And it seems like the technology is something that, you know, because we haven't experienced, the assumption is that it's not ours or that we couldn't do it. Uh, I've actually become more convinced that the technology is is a dead end. Again, they're, they're, the Germans were, were making, you know, craft, triangular craft in the 40s. They had passed, you know, all the tests. When, when, you know, what do you mean? What banks. do you mean? They had nuclear it, power yes. as a whole thing. Mike, what do you mean it was a de it's a dead end? Explain that, please. I, I don't think it's going to, I don't think it's the question to ask. In other words, I don't think it's the the thing that will tilt the, the question one way or the other. Okay. To me, the tougher issue is biologicals. Okay, you know, the, the, the claims of bodies and, and whatnot. So for right. me, that's what I would have to have. I would have to have, uh, let, let's say that, you know, we have these pictures or there's some other, you know, Real clear biological evidence. Okay, well that that answers question one. Question two is actually a little different, and that involves visitations and then individual sightings, and then you you know you sort of have to go from point one to to these other points. But for me, the fundamental question of you know are there extraterrestrials, intelligent extraterrestrials out there? I would need a biological entity because there's so much that you can you know, look at and dig out, and people have, that have just devoted their life to tracing these exotic technologies. Like even in the Majestic documents, there there are Majestic documents that actually have the elements in the quote-unquote power plant of the craft that you can find were used in technology during World War II to produce okay, I'm gonna have nuclear to power you there. without a reactor. I mean, right, it, I'm gonna have they're to, all the I'm same have, elements. The Majestic documents... Um, you know, these were quoted almost biblically for years and years and years and years <laughs> by so many people. And I guess you finally had a good, hard look and went out and got them tested. Can you describe how you did that and, and the results? Sure. And, and for listeners, uh, if, you, if they go to my website, which is just drmsh.com, at the top, there's a link that says Quick Links, and if they go to that page, they'll be able to download the uh, the study we did for free. Uh, and one of the links there, I'll just sort of overview it. What we did, and I say we because I had uh, I had known of someone named Dr. Carol Chasky, who did this for a living. Um, she is a computational linguist, and she did her doctoral work at Brown University and actually came up with her own program uh, as part of her dissertation to test something called authorship attribution. Hmm. And she has made a career, like in court cases, when someone needs to either verify or rule out that a document was written by the person that, say, signed that letter or, or claimed authorship uh, to be able to test that. And so she has had a long career, uh, and her work has been featured in numerous court cases. If you look her up on the web, you know, she has a whole list of that. So when I found out about her, I thought, well, this is the ideal person to test some of these documents if she was interested. May I when ask I contacted a, a, a quick question, sure. Mike, um, and it is this. Can you rattle off briefly the criterion she used? In other words, how does she authenticate? Mm -hmm. What, what right. methods? What, what she focuses on would not be 
common vocabulary, but would be what we call in, in grammar function words, little words like conjunctions, prepositions, interjections. In other words, the words that you don't really think about, but you just sort of habitually use in certain ways. Okay. That everybody sort of develops these unconscious patterns. And so she actually focuses on the uncommon in terms of, you know, non-specialized vocabulary, but another way to look at it is they're the most common words that everybody uses. So when you go through a document, again, in her procedure, this is what you're you're looking for. And the whole idea is to establish patterns. Now, it's only the methods we used only apply to documents in the Majestic group that had authorship attribution. In other words, mm -hmm. a particular document that supposedly was sent by, you know, Roosevelt or, you know, Tillencott or somebody like that, General Twining. Mm -hmm. Right. So we had to pull those out. And then we needed documents that were more than one or two sentences, because some of these are just memos that, you know, just one sentence. And so we had to have at least a paragraph. So we, we winnowed that. And then we wanted to zero in on the, the documents. And this was really a, a funding issue because I was paying for this. <laughs> which are the ones that have the most content that, that is the most explosive? You know, which are the ones that talk about extraterrestrial, you know, bodies or, you know, something that really, you know, has an important role to play potentially in the, in the whole narrative. And so we, we got a hold of those. And so what you do then is you have your, your, your documents that you want to test the attribution. So what I had to do, and I enlisted the help of a couple people to find, okay, we're, we're going to test two documents here that were written by, you know, General Twining. Well, let's go to archive websites and we would, you know, try to find documents that nobody is going to dispute by this particular person. So we'd pull half a dozen of those, and we had to get them all typed out. We typed them as they were. We didn't correct anything if there were typos in there. And she basically takes all of that, and she's trying to establish, again, using the computer, patterns, again, isolating on the function words, within that person's consciousness. So even if even if they were dictated as opposed to handwritten letters that were later transcribed, it's still the reflecting the thought pattern of the person that produced the particular document. And so all of the knowns get fed in and then you know patterns are established and then the unknowns it really, and what she did was was kind of interesting. She took all of them, regardless of author attribution, in one round of tests and sort of put those against all of the knowns by all the different people. There were 17 total documents, eight or nine different authors. And I asked her, well, why why would you do that round of testing? And she said, if some of these documents regardless of who the authorship is attributed to, if they start matching each other, regardless of the name, that's going to tell us uh -huh. that there may have been a common hand in producing them. I've, I've got it, right. Um, know, let, me, I thought, let me just I didn't pause even think for of one, that. One, one second, and uh, that's mm -hmm. fascinating. What is her record? In other words, uh, this sort of a test must have some sort of percentage of success associated with it historically, right? Well, there's there's going to be, in, in the results that are produced, you're going to have this, if you look at the actual document, the actual article on, on the website, I have the Excel tables reproduced in that document. It's a, it's a PDF. And there there's going to be a number... I, I hate to use the word percentage, but that's I'm not a math person, so I'll use it. There, there's a percentile uh, number that is produced by the databases, the procedures that she uses. And she will then, she she actually would tell me, because I can't decipher this, she told me what the numbers meant as far as, okay, this one you know, fits in with the patterning of the knowns, and so I, I, I would colorize them in the document for the reader. This one doesn't, this one does, and then she, she actually went, we went through every line of the spreadsheet, and she said she would highlight uh, which ones that appeared to her eye 
mathematically again according okay mike to uh, I, I, mike, mike, what, mike what i'm i'm sorry to interrupt i know you're having a hard time hearing me when i start to talk but this is really important to me to understand mm -hmm. uh what her record is in other words what her in in past uh oh, okay. of, of the same sort if she write 80% of the time, 70% of the time, 50% of the time, 99.9. .9. What what kind of, you know, hit record does she have? I I'm trying oh, to learn, she, you yeah. know, this, what kind of science we've got here. Yeah, she's going to be well into the 90s because her her work is regularly tested in court like under oath and, and things like that. So okay. anyone who's interested in her, you know, again, could go to her website. She'll she describes different court cases that she's been part of and you know what she did what she was asked no to do. it's just fine if it's in the 90s that's that's fine i just wanted to understand the science that we were hearing about so you know it i mean uh, i i think uh, genetics is like in the billions right only one chance in <laughs> five billion that's not your child <laughs> so right, okay right. Uh, 90 90 percent be or better right the so what what the end result was of the 17 documents that were tested. Again, it's a limited pool and only the ones that have an authorship attribution. Right. Only one of them uh, she was able to look at and say, this one is legit. And that was the General Twining memo to General George Shulgin. It's a 1947 document. The other ones did not align with the knowns by the same author. And so she said, in, in a court case, this would just get thrown out. You know, we, we we could not draw any conclusions. We could not say anything factual about this document. We couldn't base anything factual on this okay. particular document. So one passed the test. The, the most interesting thing to me was that, that eight of them had authorial affinities with documents in the pool that were supposedly authored by somebody else. Hmm. And she said, look. It, it doesn't prove that the documents were produced by a common hand, but it does suggest it. She was real picky about her terminology there. Okay. And I, I put, I reproduced her terminology in, in the document. She would say it doesn't prove that they were all, you know, manufactured by the same hand, but it, yeah, right. it sort of. Uh, quick, quick, quick question, Mike. Um, the twining document, the one that she uh, authenticated, what, mm -hmm. uh, could you give all of us an idea of what was the essence of the twining? Mm -hmm. It would probably be looked at as neutral uh, by you and UFO enthusiasts. There's there's nothing, there's no extraterrestrial speculation in that one. It's the one where uh, twining uh, says that you know within pre his phrases within present U.S. knowledge, you know we could reproduce these kind of craft that he was talking about. If if any of your listeners are going to look at the document, it's point F in the document where that language okay. comes from. Uh, he talks about, you know, speeds at 7,000 miles an hour that are subsonic. And, you know, Twining's assessment in that particular document is that we're not thinking extraterrestrial here. Now, obviously, there are other documents within the majestic, you know, cache that we couldn't test because they have no authorship attribution. So the study itself was limited, but it, I should mention this one other thing to, to give you know Stan Fried, Friedman some kudos here. I deliberately also chose again when there was an author documents that Friedman and others had by other means forensically shown that were fakes, and her study flagged those same documents. They did not pass the test; only one did. So it, I, I sort of I didn't tell her about that either. <laughs> I sort of use that for my own sake, that because I don't understand the science, I'm depending on her. I, sure. To me, there would be, there would have been something wrong if one of those came up good, when I knew they weren't, and so it actually validated, you know, some of what the work that Stan had done on some of these other documents. Now I know he's very committed to the extraterrestrial, you know, view of the documents, so it doesn't prove or disprove that. It does show, though, that there's a lot in this 
that really looks suspicious. And that shouldn't be earth shattering either because anybody who knows about the history of how we got the majestic documents, uh, it's, it's a very shady history. Uh, for your listeners again, I think one of the best things they can read on this is the 2007 MUFON symposium document. That was an update on majestic research. I have a link to that on my quick link site, but I, I'm kind of sour on, on the Majestic documents, and I know that there's a lot that's post-1989, which is a year that matters for this, uh, you know, this discussion that could very well be genuine, and some of the older ones might be, but it's got such a checkered history that I, I, I don't feel like I can trust them for a whole lot. Okay, so other than the Twining document, the others showed uh, basically attributes that would say, look here, the same person wrote all of these, except this one. Yeah, for instance, you, you'd be looking at a, a Hill and Cotter document that matched the profile of a JFK document. Now, that just shouldn't happen. No, no. You know, because they're different people. And she just flagged, uh, you know, eight, again, eight of the 17 just sort of, you know, stuck out like sore thumbs, you know, to her that she just thought there's just something not right here. Um, and she flagged those right off the bat. And the other ones were didn't pass the test for, you know, other reasons. But the, those eight, she said, there's eight in here that just, they just look suspicious. Okay. And, and, and and my, my next question for you, Mike, would be the UFO community. In other words, when you came out with these findings, how did the UFO community react to it? Was there a lot of anger? Were people lashing out at you, or what happened? Well, it was it was mixed as as you might expect. Uh, I I unveiled this at a conference in Roswell, and, and Rich Dolan and I talked afterwards. And Rich was was really enthusiastic about it. I mean, he more or less said, this is the kind of thing that we need to be doing. And, you know, I expect that from Rich. I think Rich is a serious researcher and, and have a high regard for you know, his commitment to, to doing real research. Um, my biggest disappointment was actually Stan Friedman because he didn't want to really hear anything about it. Uh, he, I think he somehow got, got my novel you know, which is has a lot of you know, there's a lot of religious angle to it, and, and the whole UFO question confused with this report because he he just sort of went off on it, and I was a religious fundamentalist or something like that. It's like Stan, you know, it it, it validates this other work you did. I think you you might want to actually read the document, <laughs> you know, and not get it confused with the novel. So it was mixed, you know, but I that wasn't a surprise, and it, that's okay. Um, I just wanted to is it, is it is it unfair, Mike, to suggest, as Stanton seemed to, that your religious background uh, influenced you in, in some way? I mean, I think it's a fair question. Well, it, it, it would be if I had written any of the documents and if I was, a, I was the computational linguist that had it tested. And I was the computational linguist that produced the program that had it tested. I'm none of those things. Uh, I, I was just the guy that said, hey, here's somebody who does this for a living. Would she be interested in, you know, testing these documents? And she was. Um, so, you know, it, it didn't really go anywhere as far as a huge, you know, impact because, you know, to be honest with you, people are sort of committed, you know, to what side of this question they're on. Most people you know, are are more interested in looking at evidence that kind of, you know, leans the way they, they hope it leans. Uh, I, I just want, I wanted to know, because I'm a language guy, and we sure. do this kind sure. of work, you know, in, in the office with not, not forensic, you know, authorship attribution, but we do lots of stuff with software that applies to languages. And so this just seemed an area that I could actually contribute something, you know, into ufology. So we did it. Okay. Well, it, it certainly wouldn't surprise you, Mike, would it, that uh, a lot of people would perhaps accept Stanton's notion that you are, are committed to a particular point of view, and this fits that point of view. Um, and I'm not suggesting that there's any, anything wrong with the findings or the testing or anything else, but I can see why people, you know, might say you're married with a certain point of view as well. 
Well, I don't really care one way or the other. I mean, if there are aliens out there, then great. I, I, I just like to know, and I'd like there to be real evidence. I, I don't want cloak and dagger anecdotes. You know, I don't want, you know, accusations going from this ufologist back to that ufologist where I have to oh, pick which one I like. And they that do. is not, that is not data. Mm. And if that irritates people, well, you know, so I'm not responsible for that. <laughs> okay. All right. No, that's that's entirely fair. Um, you've also debunked the ancient astronaut idea, right? I, I mean, what about the long runways down south and all of that? Uh, all the the rocks that have been uh, uh, decorated, uh, seeming to show uh, aliens with space helmets and. All of it, uh, Mike. Why? In what way do you feel? In other words, do you have something? I don't know. Equivalent to what you did with the majestic documents when it comes to ancient alien theory. Well, I, I don't. I don't. In my mind, I distinguish everything we've talked about up to this point. You know, the the question of are there extraterrestrials? Are these documents real or not? So on and so forth. I distinguish all of that. To me, that's serious ufology. Right. The ancient alien stuff, I don't take seriously at all, because I do know ancient texts, and I do know ancient history. I, I, I know where to get to information in archaeology and anthropology and all this stuff. And that part, and I know they get lumped together, and I understand why they get lumped together. But I treat one seriously, and I treat the other not seriously, because frankly, the work is is extraordinarily poor and in many cases just literally made up. And I don't think it really deserves the amount of attention that the other part of ufology gets. Well, there is some hard evidence in forms of uh, pictograms and in, uh, in the form of uh, what appear to be runways, that kind of thing. How, how do you handle that? So we have, we, ha we have a pictogram from a foreign culture. Mm -hmm. We have no text that tells us what it is. Very true. So what we have, and this is just the blunt reality, okay? I'm, this is real, Bill, here. We have a picture that I'm going to use my 21st century mind, part of which is influenced by this narrative, and I, now I'm going to interpret that picture. I could be miles and miles and miles and miles and miles away from anything accurate. And in most cases, people have been able to, to produce uh, the same picture in other provenanced objects where it's clear as to what the purpose of this thing was or, you know, what, you know, there might be a text that goes with it. You know, th th that's when you really get lucky when there's actually text textual material that goes with it. And enough bad work <laughs> has been demonstrated in that area, and it's inherently subjective. Again, to, to me, it, it's the badness of the work that's out there that, I will admit, colors my opinion of the the enterprise, you know, of, of the whole thing. I'll give you an example. You have these, quote, unquote, reptilian figurines that are circulating on the, on the web, and people are referring to them as Anunnaki figurines. Well, guess what? Yeah, they come from Iraq, but they come from a civilization that predated the writing, predated writing period. They predate the Sumerian text, and they don't have any text on them. Why? Because writing hadn't been invented yet. There is nothing about the object that tells you anything about it, that identifies right. it in any way. But people right. will take it and just run with it. All right, Mike, welcome back. I guess you're not uh, married uh, to much of uh, uh, the Anunnaki, Anunnaki stuff, right? Well, as far as ancient aliens goes, no. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the Anunnaki, of course, show up in, in Sumerian, cuneiform texts. I mean, they're, it's a little over 100 times. You know, I, I should say something... In, I don't know whether to encourage people to go see this or not. <laughs> One of the things I did on my uh, on my website that's devoted to uh, Zechariah Sitchin and ancient astronaut stuff was I figured, well, I don't want people to just take my word for it. When I say insane things like, look, the fundamental ideas of what Zechariah Sitchin is saying, that the Anunnaki come from Nibiru, 
that uh, you know they were here to mine gold that you know Nibiru is this planet beyond you know Saturn and all, all really the fundamental tenets of, of the system right. rather than take my word for it what I did was I created a screen capture video of me going to a website called the electronic text corpus of Sumerian literature hmm. and I I know it doesn't sound exciting <laughs> <laughs> Talk about things that do not translate well to radio, or really anything for that matter. Um, I put in a search for the term Anunnaki, and the video is me putting the search term in, clicking the button, getting all of the occurrences of the term Anunnaki, where they occur in the tablets, getting them back in the search, showing people, now look, if you if you hit TR here, that takes you to an English translation. There are 117 or so of these. This is on my, my website, uh, the, the Sitchin website, Sitchin is And you did, you, you did this, why? So that people could watch it and do it themselves. Because I don't like arguments from authority. Yeah, here's Mike with the PhD in ancient Semitic languages and all this stuff. Big deal. Okay, you should not have to depend on what Mike says about this. Go to the site. Run the search, click the translation, and you will see that I'm correct here. Okay, none of these ideas about the Anunnaki that, that Sitchin really depends on to, to roll out his extraterrestrial narrative, the texts don't say anything about the Anunnaki in regard to these items at all. It literally doesn't even exist. It's not a question of, well, Mike would translate it this way, but someone else would translate it that way. I'm saying the material doesn't even exist. Now, if I made a crazy claim like that without knowing that it was real, I mean, I'd have to have my head examined, okay? But I got so tired of, of trying to explain to people this is not a translation issue, at least in regard to the Anunnaki. Are, are, you, uh, are, you suggesting, are you suggesting by implication that Zachariah needs his head examined? No, the, the, the late Zechariah Sitchin did not need his head examined. What I think, and I, I've, heard really, I've heard people say really nasty things about Sitchin that I just think are nutty. Okay, I do not think Zechariah Sitchin is a reptilian. Okay, I do not think he was an Illuminati agent. No, but you and think everything, the... everything pretty much that he thought was wrong. And, I, think, and... I, think his, I think his narrative, his, his explanation of the Sumerian text is completely wrong. But what, I, what I think he actually did is, you know, he, he, he reads the text in translation, you know, using Kramer or some other known translation at the time. And I think he essentially created what, what you could loosely call an allegory. I think he tried to marry what he was reading with the characters in the mythologies, and, and then he, he would get into cosmological text. And he, he married that somewhat to Velikovsky, you know, the whole worlds and collision thing. Right, right. And, well, and I, he, I interviewed him, he uh, this Mike, I interviewed him many times, and he, believe me, was very, very married to it. There's no question about oh, it. Oh, I know. He, he, he was absolutely committed to it. Like an article of faith. Yep, yep. And I, I'm just saying, look, there's, there's just nothing here. I mean, it, it, it's not the same in other issues, you know, that, that where you do, you know, there are issues of this is a good translation, that's a bad translation, you know. It, it, it's not anything you could put in one category, but as far as the, I should mention this too. One of the other things I did beside creating that exciting video for people was I looked up all of the scholarly academic articles on the Anunnaki I could find. There were three of them. Unfortunately, they were all in German. There's nothing more recent than the mid-20th century, and I hired someone, you know, a specialist in German, to translate the documents. People can get those translations as they are. It's, it's a lot of pages because they're you know, 50, 60 pages, but you can actually have the, the best research on the Anunnaki Sumerian Assyrian scholars. And I, I try to do this because I don't want people depending on Mike. I, I, don't, I don't like arguments from authority. I like to direct people back to primary texts and say, go just go read them. Don't take somebody's opinion. Just go read the things and you'll see.
Mm -hmm. All right. Here is Linda, who sends me a message. Art, he does not believe the scientists who carbon date things. If you come up with a test done by other scientists, he will tell you that they did it wrong or made mistakes. Unfair? Yeah. What's wrong with carbon dating? I, I, don't, I don't know, Linda. It's carbon dating. I heard you... Heard you <laughs> Linda apparently heard you reference something that was carbon dated. Right, here's, that, if, if I got one of these today, let, let's use this. Here's, here's a good teaching point here. This is what Mike will do. Okay. I got an email from somebody that sent me a picture of an object and says, what do you think of this object that I you know, discovered? And, you know, it starts telling me what it is. Okay, and that's it, ancient alien stuff. My first question is always, okay, I need to know where it was provenanced. In other words, where was it discovered? I need to know that it was not a disturbed site. Can you direct me to the publication, to the archaeological publication? I have access to lots of databases as a faculty member. I can get to a lot of things that other people can't. Can you give me the, the archaeologist's name or the art? I mean, I'll, I'll find it if you give me the information, and I'll go read it. And I'll, I'll maybe I'll post it on a blog if you like. I mean, I'll, I'll ask them. Ninety-nine percent of the time, I don't get anything back. What I want is I want real data. If you give me a carbon date for something, my first question will be, where, who dated it? Show me the report. All this stuff gets published. You know, this is not, you know, secrecy. The, it, there are millions and millions and millions of pages put out in the social sciences, archaeology, anthropology, every blasted year. Okay, I can get that stuff. I want to go read it so that I know, you know, sort of where to start. You know, what, who did this? You know, who, who discovered it? I'll email those people and say, hey, Professor So-and-so, I read your article on this and that, and I have a question. I'll do stuff like that. I don't think that's unreasonable. I really no. don't. No, it's not unreasonable. But again, when people look at you, uh, they... They get irritated. They, well, perhaps a little. <laughs> um, I call myself the equal opportunity offender because I, I'll do this with, with Christians that email me too about some point of, well, you know, you're you're a heretic out there because you don't believe in the global flood or you don't believe in this or you don't believe in that. You know, and whether I do or not, or, you know, most of the time they're just repeating something they heard. I'm going to ask them for the same thing because, look, even if I like your position, a bad argument in defense of a good position is still a crappy argument. Mm. That's what it is. So wouldn't you rather have a good argument for what you believe as opposed to a bad one? Okay, and well, people let's get, try they get angry. Okay, you know, okay, let's try this. Look, uh, the world has been around for a very, very long time. I don't know if you saw the series on, uh, on TV about uh, after man or after, uh, after man. It, it showed how quickly society, the buildings, the things that we... we we see every day would be dust and gone, and and the answer is pre pretty quickly. Uh, so, is it really beyond reason to suggest that there could have been others here from elsewhere, or there could have been civilizations prior to the one we're so proud of right now? Well, that's an argument that could actually be used you know, both ways uh, to argue oh, that oh. point and also to argue against that point. Mm -hmm. You know, and, uh, you know, it's other problem is it's an argument from silence. Well, I don't see this, I don't see a whole lot of buildings in this place, but boy, the earth's been around here so long, so they must have been here. Mm -hmm. Well, I, mm -hmm. that's kind of really not argu you know, a, good, a sound argument. I mean, in theory, you know, we have... You know, we have evidence of, of writing, which is a mark of, of a high civilization. Uh, people don't stop to think about how important writing is, but you need, you know, to preserve thoughts for the next generation on practical things, how to build things, how to make things, so on and so forth. So yeah. I would expect, you know, if there, if there were like these long ago civilizations, like let's say Blavatsky talks about, you know, millions and millions and millions of years, well, it's really convenient to, to attach that number to it because then you think that that exempts you from having any evidence 
Well, it, it really doesn't, because if you're going to make the claim, I need to know that the claim is reasonable. And I don't think that is an unreasonable thing to ask for. I can say, I can sit here and say, well, it's possible. Sure, Art, it's possible. Sure, whatever, you know, the, the questioner's name was, that, that's possible. It's possible maybe in the sense that I could be the next American Idol. Okay, that's possible too. I could wake up tomorrow with a bump on the head and I wake up and I have a great voice. I audition for the show and I, you know, I win the American Idol. Yeah, that's possible. Really? Well, not, not um, based on what I've heard so far tonight. I mean, you, you, no, you, it's a great conversation, but you know, you're not singing, you're not it ain't gonna doing happen. anything. But it's possible. Yeah. <laughs> well. Stranger things. Have, I mean, you, you you see where the the conversation goes. So on the one hand, I don't have any problem saying, well, you know, that that could be, but I, I'm not going to to base what I think or believe on a could be. I, I think it's more reasonable to just ask: is there is there one thing that you know makes this a little more con concrete that takes it out of the realm of complete speculation into the realm of hey look at this thing we have here we need to think about this object or this text you know and i i just don't think it's unreasonable I, and i know it irritates okay. people all right my god uh, you my wife when i'm like that too uh -huh. would you would you <laughs> apply the same standards of proof mike to the concept of intelligent design yeah, I, I've said for a long time that I I think intelligent design really doesn't it doesn't prove anything. <laughs> if I could be really blunt about it, I mean, intelligent design is not really a theory about who the designer or designers are. I, I've I've said for many years that look, you can take all the arguments for intelligent design and put an S on the end. And you can make the same arguments. And, and again, a Christian audience, that just irritates the heck out of them because they're going to assume that the designer must be the God of the Bible. And it's like, well, sure, I, I want to think that too. But if we're actually looking at the argument, intelligent design, all it says, it, all it argues for is that the best explanation for some natural phenomena is some sort of intelligent cause and it's a reasoning by analogy here's a thing that looks like it has intricate design therefore it probably it maybe had a designer okay that's wonderful if you can test it but ultimately at the end of the day even if you're right you still don't know who the designer is okay and so it's extremely limited i i don't think I don't, I don't want to say it's not useful, because I, I think it is. I don't want to see God divorced from the conversation, you know, about creation and things like that. But the other, the other side of it is it, it's quite limited. It's more limited than the average person who gets excited about it, you know, really thinks about it. Do you, do you believe in intelligent design one way or the other, whether you, whether you say God did it or it was a natural process? Uh, with somebody's hand in it or an extraterrestrial hand or whatever, do you believe in intelligent design or is it all random? I, I do believe that there is a, a creator. Creator. Okay. A creator. Right. Okay. And, and what, right. What I mean by that is I, I see a philosophical necessity to have a distinction between creation and the causation, you know, some causation, whether that's an impersonal thing like, like Big Bang or, or whatever, you know, that, that's a, you're at a different level of questioning there. But I don't see all as one. I'm not a monist. I would be a dualist, that there's a distinction between creation and then its causation. And so because I hold that position, yeah, I, I think that there are some things that do speak to intelligent design. But in terms of an honest philosophical argument, winning that particular argument does not link that argument to a specific creator. I mean, that's just being honest you know, with, with the philosophical argument. And most intelligent design theorists themselves uh, will, will tell you that. I mean, it... it when this kind of stuff filters down into the into the lay community and in the internet, then you, it starts to become more of a religious argument. Hmm. So you believe, you do believe, to boil it down, in intelligent design that there was 
a creator. Is that creator mm-hmm. the one of the? Is that creator the one of the Bible? I think that any creator would have to be a creator like is described in the Bible, and that is totally distinct from creation. And again, characteristics of um, you know omnipotence and that sort of thing. I don't believe, however, that creation had to be perfect. In fact, I actually think, and this gets me in trouble again with the Christian camp, I don't think that the Bible describes a perfect creation. That opens all kind of, you know, worms for that audience. But um, you, when you start to, to say things like, well, the Creator would have done this or that, or would not have done this or that, and evolutionists who want to be materialists, you know, who are atheistic, they say these things all the time. Well, you can't have intelligent design because God wouldn't have done this, would he? Well, you're making a theological argument. I, don't, I hope you realize that, Mr. Scientist. That's a theological argument. You're telling me what the deity that you don't believe in would or would not have done. That's not a science-based argument. That is a theological argument. So, again, just to get that off the table, I, I don't believe that that imperfection argues against intelligent design. Let's just put it that way. Okay. I accept imperfection. Uh, do you think that the process of evolution is ongoing, as in still? Yeah, I, I don't see if... If we accept the idea of evolution, I don't think that there would be any way to coherently demonstrate that it's all stopped. I don't. I don't know how you demonstrate that. Nor I don't see do any I. reason to conclude that. Mm-hmm. Well, where do you think we're going, uh, Mike? With uh, with quantum physics, it is uh, a real mystery spooky action at a distance or whatever it was that uh, mm-hmm. Einstein said about it. It is pretty weird stuff to try and wrap your mind around. What do you think? I, I, I'm fascinated. with. I'm, I'm not a physicist. I, I don't have the, the mechanical mind to really grasp a lot of this stuff. But I think that stuff is just fascinating. I also think it's the friend of theology. Um, and again, this is going to get me in trouble with that mm. part of the part of your audience, but whatever. Um, think, think of it this way. Most Christians, many Christians, whether they could tell you where the idea comes from, you know, are really disturbed by the idea that, you know, God doesn't have everything predestined. If I walk into a, a room full of Christians to, to speak on something, and I say, hey, look, I don't believe that everything is nailed down. I don't believe that foreknowledge... God's foreknowledge necessitates his predestining of all things. That freaks people out, okay? But that's exactly what quantum physics you know, has demonstrated. There's this certain random quality to it. And I can show you passages in the New Testament that talk about how, how creation mirrors the character of the creator. I can take you to passages that very clearly show that God foreknows things that do not come to pass. And that tells you immediately, point blank, that God knew something that didn't come to pass. Therefore, that thing was not predestinated. But uh, I hate to say it this way. A lot of Christians are not very familiar with their Bible. They... They aren't aware of a lot of these things in it. Again, the academics, you know, this stuff gets thrown around all the time. Um, but when you when you try to, you know, do stuff on the internet, when you try to do stuff on radio, you try to get people interested in the discussion. It people don't like it. <laughs> I don't know how else to put it. I mean, I, when, I, I wouldn't it be interesting to actually to give the Bible to that same lady who looked at the majestic documents? You know, we, we have actually talked to her about that. This is, this is an interesting rabbit trail. Oh, really? Um, her, yeah, her undergraduate degree, Carol's undergraduate degree was in Greek. So I'll just describe what we, we have asked her in the past. There, there are certain books of the New Testament that are what are called uh, disputed authorship books, uh, the pastoral epistles, for, for instance, uh, that would be First and Second Timothy and Titus, are no, sort of notorious in the academic realm for scholars fighting about, did Paul really write this or not? So we, we've asked her, you know, hey, are, are you interested in this because we can give you, you know, the, the digital form of the Greek New Testament and, and, you know, 
check out authorship attribution. And of course, she brings up the obvious problem. Well, you'd have to also hand me documents to create a profile that you know for certain were written by this particular individual. And she, and you know, frankly, we, you know, mm. we wonder, can, could we do that? Because most of Paul's letters, we'll just use Paul for an example, most of Paul's letters are disputed in some way at some point in the letters, even the ones that are sort of, you know, everybody accepts as genuinely Pauline. Um, so is there a way we could actually construct this test? There have been whole books on something called stylometry, trying to test this. Now, Carol's methods are a little different, and there are computational linguists in our field who are applying this to certain you know, books, usually in the New Testament, because it's shorter, uh, and it, does, it takes less work to produce the, the raw data. And the, the results are mixed, but you know, she'd have her own unique approach. So that might happen. We might be able to you know, convince her to do this, and it would have to be you know, worthwhile. We, we would not get. We'd want to get something publishable out of it. But there are scholars who who do that. You wouldn't. You wouldn't be afraid of that. Oh no, I, I think it'd be very interesting. Uh, again, my my view of inspiration. This is a, a theological term that Christians throw around a lot, and and conservative Jews throw throw it around too. You know, that scripture comes from from God. Well, I I believe that. I think that God. If I embrace the idea of a creator, the idea that that this that a deity could influence somebody to write something seems like a pretty short jump. I mean, I can do that. Mm. You know, I can influence somebody to write something down for posterity. Big deal. So I don't view inspiration as this paranormal event, like the prophet wakes up and starts making breakfast, and then you know God zaps him and he his mind you know leaves his body, and then he wakes up an hour later and looks down at a text and says, "Boy, wow, look at that! Didn't I do a great job of that?" <laughs> that isn't the way it's described, even in the Bible. It's a very human process where specific literary genres are used, uh, specific forms of literature, like an Old Testament passage you know, about a treaty. Well, guess what? It'll conform to treaty patterns in the ancient Near East. Law codes will conform. Hmm. Writers would do this because if they didn't do it, you'd think they were hacks. You'd think they wouldn't know what they're doing. Like, doesn't this guy know how to write a treaty? I mean, what a bonehead. Okay, the writers were people, and they used the tools, the knowledge, the vocabulary at their time to produce what, you know, I would say what God wanted them ultimately to do. I have a very providential view of, of inspiration that, that's very human, but doesn't, God plays the ultimate role, preparing okay. them in their lives for that moment to produce that thing. Certainly genetic arguments against it. I've actually followed this one for the last two or three years pretty closely. Um, it's quite controversial uh, even within uh, Christian circles because you have Christian geneticists on both sides of this one. Um, here in my neck of the woods, there is the, the guy lives who more or less started the whole thing, uh, Dennis Benema uh, of Trinity Western produced an article that really argued against a historical Adam and Eve because of statistics, that you can't account for populations as we know them by, as, as coming from a single pair. And that's been batted around quite a bit. Uh, some people, and I think about this, some people would say, well, we don't really need to care about a single pair because... If we go back to a literal reading of Genesis after the flood, we have more than one pair. We have four, Noah and his sons. And so then the argument proceeds from there. Uh, my view is I don't think that theologically uh, we have to affirm uh, a historical Adam, although I'm not convinced that we shouldn't affirm that. In other words, I think the genetics is still divided on the issue. So I think, you know, 5, 10, 20 years, you know, we may, you know, statistical genetics might be uh, an area that really gets a lot of attention, more work's put into it. We might have something more conclusive than it is now, but um, there are good arguments. You sound um, pretty unsure, but um, what yeah, I, I noticed is I don't, our, our I don't know where to that... come down. Yeah, but our, I've, I have noticed that arguments that could go either way, um, like somebody who is a little married to what he believes, uh, you have them fall down in your direction. 
Oh, I, I don't know means I don't know. <laughs> okay. Now, yeah, right. the, the, for your for your readers or your listeners, I think one of the better books on this is by a guy named Peter Enns. It's about you know the historical Adam, the evolution of Adam. It's called. It ends as an Old Testament scholar like I am. I know Pete. Um, you know he got into into trouble for for a neutral position on this, or actually one that favored the evolutionary argument. But his argument is actually text based, and that is he marshals a lot of evidence, and he's depending on the dissertation that somebody else wrote in part, that the story of Adam is actually a deliberate parallel to the story of Israel. And if that's the case, then the whole point of the story of Adam might be, again, something literary, talking about the nation, using this, this story to parallel the history of the nation. And you, you get mean, into you mean metaphorical? It's a, it's a yeah, metaphorical yeah. thing? Yeah, I mean, that, right. And he, hmm. I think he does a good job of laying it out for the non-specialist. It's controversial. Uh, I, I like parts of what his argument says. I, I like, you know, other, I don't like other parts of it. But I think in this case, I don't think genetics lies, obviously. Uh, I do think, though, that, and the people who are in the field will tell you this uh, in the articles they produce, that statistical genetics is still somewhat new because the, the genome isn't that recent. You know, they're still, it's a burgeoning field. So I think for this one, it's like 10, 20 years down the road, we may have something more conclusive. But either way, in terms of biblical scholarship or theology, um, I think this is something that can go either way. And I know that would upset a lot of people uh, for different reasons. But again, for those of you who are Christians out there listening, I can say this because I do not take Romans 5 the same way most of you do. So we'll just leave it there, I guess. <laughs> then I it guess. becomes okay. a okay. Well, I mean, it, it, so... When you get to the genetics, um, you would think the percentages would be way below what the MJ-12 document reader was able to achieve. You know, I, I don't know that I'm qualified to, to comment Answer. on a comparison because yeah. I don't yeah. really know either either field. But, you know, genetics doesn't lie. I mean, we depend on genetics for a lot of different things, you know, in terms of medicine. Uh, agriculture, all sorts of things. I mean, genetics is genetics. I mean, it, it, it's real. The data are real. The, the issue is the statistical analysis of the data. So who knows? I mean, Carol might be able to look at it and say, well, this is like what I do or not like what I do. I, I'm just not qualified to say that, you know, make that comparison. Okay. Well, I, I was just interested in the weight that you put on one versus the other. If That's people want to go... I, I would, if you're interested in this question, for your listeners, again, if you go to my website, drmsh.com, up at the top, one of my blogs, it's called The Naked Bible, uh, you click on that, and you can go to that site, and on that site, there is a tab that talks about uh, anthropology, okay, biblical anthropology, which includes the Adam question, and there's one on Romans 5. Again, it's a key passage in this. I've, I've blogged a lot on, on this because I'm interested in genetics. I think it's, it's kind of fascinating. Again, even though I can't digest a lot of it, I'm really fascinated by it. Well, if genetics comes along and begins to say things that are, I don't know, in, in direct contrast to, to, to what you believe, and I, I know you do have faith, Mike, and uh, you know some of what you say has got to be influenced by that faith. Uh, to be an, uh, an uneven world if it was not so. Uh, so would you admit that, that that is to some degree true? Well, here's my secret, Art. Your, your, okay. your listeners can, can, can get the alert here. Okay. I don't believe at all that Genesis, and the, and the Bible for that matter, is, was written, was inspired to teach us science. Okay. We talk a lot about the need to interpret the Bible in context. Especially Again, you, you, you think it was metaphorical, really? No, no. I, I think the, the, the context for the Bible is the context that produced it. In other words, it's not the Reformation, it's not the early church, it's not the Catholic Church, it's not this creed or that creed. The context that produced the Bible is the one that was around when the biblical writers were living and writing. And as a, as a scholar, again, as a close reader of the text in the original languages, what you have in Genesis 
is really, really close, very similar because of the common worldview to other ancient Near Eastern cosmologies. You know, they're, they're not trying to teach us science. They're trying to teach us theological messaging that we have a creator. Here's who the creator is. It's Yahweh, the God of Israel. Humanity's here because he wants them here. We are his imagers. We're his representatives. That should work our, work its way out into our lives in certain ways. Uh, they're not scientists. They're, they live in a pre-scientific world. So the messaging isn't about science. Now, I don't think the theological messaging contradicts science, though. I, d I am a theist. I am a, someone who believes in a creator. And I can, you know, stack PhDs all night long of people in the hard sciences I personally know who would stand with me in belief in a creator. Uh, I don't, I don't think it, uh, it overturns that apple cart at all. Now, now what's problematic about that with a lot of hearers, you know, people that would hear me is that they're used to having their Bible filtered to them through a creed or, or a tradition. Yeah. And I don't really, I'm not, I'm not antagonistic to creeds and traditions. I'm more apathetic toward them. And, and I'll grant you, I can say that because I've had the training. I, do, I know all the languages and all that stuff, but I have to be honest with people and say, look, this is the way I, I look at things. I take the Bible for what it is. I do believe there's a God. I believe in a creator. I believe that, that the God is behind this thing we call the Bible. But we have to put it in its own context and ask ourselves what I think are reasonable questions. Why would God choose this time and place to do this? What's the point of it? What is he trying to message to us and what, what is peripheral? Things like this. So I... You know, as a scholar, I'm very mainstream in that. But when it comes to, you know, people who, you know, don't work in the field, uh, some things I say can, can bother them. And I, I understand why that is, but well, that, I just don't filter it. People, a lot of my guests bother people. For example, <laughs> I had a fellow on named uh, Matthew kidding. Alper recently. Mm -hmm. Matthew wrote a book called The God Heart of the Brain. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've, and I've heard, you know, not the most recent show, but I've heard previous shows. Okay, good, uh, good, Matt. good. All right, all right so basically um, he's saying that, look, human beings have an, an innate fear of their own mortality, and the brain has adapted over time to embrace the concept of a creator in order to assuage that, that fear of mortality. And it is a reasonable thing to imagine. Um, I wonder how you address something like that. Well, your your audience will understand when I say this, and I'll and I'll try to unpack it. If I had to put my money on Matthew Alper or Dean Radin, my mm. money is on Dean. Okay. In other words, Alper's position depends on philosophical materialism, that all that is real is somehow biologically based or material based. Okay, I don't believe that. Lots of people don't believe it who have nothing theological invested in it. And lots of neuroscientists don't believe it. The, the, the real question comes down to, is, is all this stuff something the brain produces or something the brain receives or mediates or filters? You know, you have the radio and you have radio waves. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, one of Alper's things is, well, if you took this gene out or you took this drug, it would sort of shut the thing off. Well, if I took the battery out of a radio that I've been listening to, I cannot conclude that the radio waves are not still there. Well, one of the things okay. he did say, I, I, I want you to address this, is that, look, if you take somebody who is very religious and they have an accident, they hit their head, many times they're suddenly not religious anymore exactly exactly what i would expect that phenomenon works just fine with the idea that the brain is a receiver or filter of consciousness you do not need to have the idea that the brain produces consciousness or is consciousness to explain that both paradigms can explain that very same thing and again i, I think uh, on, on one hand, Albert, what Albert's saying is, is I think, more intelligent than weird stuff like the God Helmet guy, you know, which, which I think is just ridiculous. So I'm, I'm going to give Albert credit for coming up with a more thoughtful 
idea. It's, it's not unique with him. I mean, if anybody who's studied, and again, this is something else I'm interested in, the whole problem, quote unquote, of consciousness, uh, gets into the mind body problem, the mind body issue. And neurosciences, you know, neuroscientists are, are divided on this issue. I, I mean, I would want to know things like, well, why doesn't everyone believe in God then? Why do some people who believe in God later embrace atheism? Well, the numbers and are why are conceptions high, though, of Why are conceptions of God so different? Right. Let me repeat. The, the, the percentages are very, very high. I mean, even if you go to islands... Percentages been, for, for which? Uh, those who believe either in God or a God. Those who worship, it's almost universal. You can go to islands that have been barely touched Oh, I touched would expect by, that. Uh, okay. Well, I mean, again, if we're going to, well, let's just throw throw the Bible in here again. Romans 1, Ecclesiastes, teach the idea that since we are made by God, we are designed okay, to want to seek him. We have this, this innate sense, innate urge, again, this, this, and if we don't have that relationship, we have this gap or this empty space in us. So again, it's a, it's a very first century or more ancient way of saying just what you said. I mean, we would, we would expect that if we are made in God's image, there would be something in us that would be attracted to him, that would seek him, that, that would, would feel incomplete without it. So that doesn't surprise me at all. Again, going back to the, to the two sides of the issue, uh, you don't need Alper's position to explain that. Alper would agree with a lot of what you just said. Oh, I know, and, and neuroscientists who would disagree with his explanation of it would also agree with him. There's a lot of agreement here. It really it comes down again to that sort of radio analogy. Is it the thing that produces the sound waves, or does it receive them from somewhere else? So ultimately, it comes down to this issue of are you a materialist or are you not? Okay. Um what about, uh, let's go back for a second to intelligent design. What about the argument that as we look around us every day, uh, Mike, everything is just as it has to be. Now, you can, you can attribute that uh, to, to a maker, or you can attribute that to the fact that we're here, and we wouldn't be unless it was as it must be. We need you know, we, we came up in a, in a world where we need this kind of oxygen mix, the right gases, the right, you know, there's water, there's everything that we mm -hmm. need. Mm -hmm. Well, you can attribute that to a designer, uh, if you wish, or you can attribute it to the fact that it couldn't be any other way and have a speed. Right, well, that, that, that's true. And someone who, I mean, you've, you've interviewed Hugh Ross before, and this is, this is exactly where Hugh Ross is at, he, the, the so-called anthropic principle. Right. Um, the second option, you know, if, if, you know, I were Hugh Ross, I would say, well, isn't that, isn't that less of an explanation than the first option? Because the first option allows the second to exist, whereas the second one doesn't you know, allow the first to exist. In other words, we're, we're designed as intelligent beings, and intelligent beings will at some point ask that question. You know, so I, that's a long way of saying, yeah, you know, both are on the table, both people, you know, both options are held by different people, and that's kind of where these arguments stall, you know, which it becomes a philosophical argument rather than a scientific argument, which one is more coherent, and that's where the argument takes place. I, I think the argument for theism is more coherent. Hmm. Would you think that uh, if you were addressing a whole room full of ufologists, would you um, basically tell them they're wasting their time? No, no. If if it's ancient alien stuff, I would say yes, you're wasting your time. Really? If it's again what what I define as serious ufology, uh, again, I think most people who witness these things are are being very forthright. They're telling the truth. I saw this or that. Um, you know. The, so I don't I don't think this is a field that is full of I mean we have hoaxers but I don't think it's full of them or people who want publicity and all again we know those people are out there but for the most part I think people really are serious about it and really want to know and I'm in that bunch that would like to know and so if we're talking about 
in our world today, again, back to the mm -hmm. technological and the biological question, since I think it's reasonable to discuss the idea that extraterrestrials could exist, then I'd like to know if they do and if this particular sighting or a crash or whatever it is, that might help us answer one of those questions. Why not? Why shouldn't we be doing that? So I don't think right. they're wasting their time at all. Okay. Um, here's one for you. This is just a what if. I'd, I'd kind of like to know how Mike would react. Okay. Is that all right? Mm -hmm. Sure. If we were contacted, um, if we were suddenly to receive a signal, and that signal uh, verified uh, was verified by everybody in sight uh, as being extraterrestrial, and the signal included the information that, yes, we have been watching you uh, since it all began for you, since you became intelligent beings, and we are your makers. I wonder how you personally would react to that. I would like proof for that. In other words, the, the fact that you're a, a communicative being that's been around longer than we have and, you know, has some whatever point of superior technology, uh, I've learned from my human experience that advanced technology does not translate necessarily to truth-telling and good motives or ethics. And so I'm going to assume that you perhaps evolved along the same trajectories, and so I need you to prove that case. And then I'd also like to know, why are you telling me that? Are you trying to make me fear you? Are you, pre are you just preparing you know, me for your overlordship? Or what is it? I mean, I, I would want it to be a conversation rather than a statement. Um, and I think a lot of what I would think past that would have a lot to do with the reaction. I don't know. Perhaps as a father would sit down with a matured son and uh, explain to him that, I don't know, um, son, you're 21 now, and I've, I've got to tell you that we adopted you when you were very young, or, you know, some, some rep, something mm. like that. In other words, we had matured to the point that we were prepared or we were ready to hear something like that. Right. Well, I, I would want to know. I mean, I'd, I'd have questions. Proof. You'd want proof. Well, I, I would want proof, but in, in that, in that uh. scenario, I'd also want to know why. I mean, why... You know, I know you're telling me that I had to be at a certain maturity level. I get that part, but I'd want to know things about well, why was I up for adoption? You know, you know, what about my biological parent? I would want to know what the history is behind that a little bit. So, I think my own reflex, given the first scenario with the extraterrestrial question, is um, I think it'd be very natural to have you know questions that relate to validation. I think as human beings, uh, that's a normal reflex with us. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't see any reason to suppress it or, or to hide it at that point. Point in, Mike. You think you're uh, ready for some questions? Absolutely. That's what the show's about. That's what it's about. Is right. Uh, Dark matter. You are on the air with Mike Heiser. Hello. 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 Yes. Hi. Hi. Yes. Hi. Uh, Mike, um, mm -hmm. I, have a, I have a question for you. Um, right at the beginning of the show, you mentioned that uh, you needed proof for, um, for UFOs or ancient aliens and so forth and so on. And, but you set the Bible as, as set in stone, like it's, it's the law, it's, it's actually literal. And But there's no proof of, of the Bible or God. Can you provide the proof of that there is a God or a creator? Well, I, I didn't say that the Bible is literal. A couple times during the conversation, I've pretty much said the exact opposite. Uh, but your fundamental question is, can I prove that there's a God? If you're asking for scientific proof, the, the answer is no, because, again, 
the theological idea, the philosophical idea, is that God is distinct from creation, so you can't put him under a microscope and prove him. This is why the argument is philosophical, and what I mean by that is, what is more coherent? The idea that everything is here because of nothing, or everything is here because of something. So, when it comes to the philosophical argument, yeah, I think there are really good uh, philosophical arguments that favor the existence of a being that we would call God. Okay, so uh, the being could be God, or it could be an alien, or a, some other um, well, it, 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 in terms of an alien, I mean, if again, we I think we have to be on the same page here. I I, I kind of think we are. Uh, I define the alien as an extraterrestrial life form that is the product of evolution, and so that's quite different uh, than God. So there's a disconnect there. You'd have to I'd have to hear what you thought about that. Okay, because uh, in, in terms of of uh, other civilizations or or God or Adam and Eve, I mean, I, I look at the Bible and it depends. You take some some passages as literal, some as metaphoric. Um, and again, you went back to the author, uh, the the writers of of the Bible. How can you prove that what they written in the Bible itself is is uh, literal or metaphoric or you know, what's, what, what do you think about that? Well, on, on, on one level, I don't care, because I think the, the point of the Bible is not to teach us science. Now, I think creation is something that we should study, something that God would expect us to study. Uh, science is just as much of a worthy endeavor as, you know, pastoring a church or something like that. It's about a set of ideas, and I think the ideas, not just with the Bible, but, you know, other ancient texts are coherent. We didn't put creation here, the creation we experience and see. We're not responsible for it, so somebody else must be. Okay, that takes you into this idea of a creator, and I think that's a reasonable assumption. It didn't but, make but, itself. But Mike, I Mike, Mike, it Mike, 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 I think that a lot of ideas that talk about uh, previous civilizations and or uh, creatures from elsewhere they're coherent. I think a lot of these ideas are coherent. And it does seem to me, Mike, that when it comes to those sorts of things, you demand a very great level of proof. But when it I, comes, you, you, you know where I'm going, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Maybe, the, maybe That's kind of what the caller is saying here. Well, when it, when it comes to the the demand for proof for a biological entity, I would like biology. When it comes to the demand for proof for a non-biological entity like God, then I think by definition we have to look at it philosophically, you know, the rules of logic. and things. It's, it's kind of the difference between scientific evidence and legal evidence. They're you know, we, we use them both, but they're not the same, and we can argue about which one's better. And, but the fact is that each of them applies in its different realm. And so, you know, I can't reproduce a crime or a crime, you know, some event that happened in court. But I can argue, again, using the rules of logic and points of evidence for this scenario is more coherent than this other scenario over here. So I, I think the the requirement, the requirements for both are appropriate to the realms in which they're hmm. operating. Caller? So so you have faith in in God, but in terms of a biological being, you need actual physical proof. Your faith what? in God is basically your, your proof that there is a, a creator which you call God, correct? But if no, I, would, biological... I, I would not use... I would not use the word faith. I would use the idea that there is a God is more reasonable. I don't really divorce reason and faith, you know, that, that much. And I mean, some people do, some people don't. But I think I think faith without reason is pretty useless. Right. I mean, I I, I look at faith as uh, just something in your head, just something that you believe in, but there is no actual proof. But faith, but you, faith in but that. you do have reasons that you believe in whatever you know, whatever it is you believe, and I I think that's perfectly appropriate. So what I'm saying is I, I believe that it's more coherent to believe in a creator than not. 
to me that's more reasonable and you know this isn't a logic class so we don't need to you know go down a right. really boring road for radio but I'm yeah. hoping you get the the idea yeah I, I do I do I, I'm just trying to to understand like uh, faith and an actual proof of of uh, biological being uh, being the creator because uh, when it comes to God we all believe that God with our faith not actual proof of any um, physical proof of a natural God or biological being, correct? It's, it's so, actually a little hard. It's actually a little hard to make a, a really clean cut distinction in some regards because even in the realm of science, there's there's an interpretive aspect to certain things where we we have data. Data is produced by scientific observation and inquiry and experimentation and all that. But when we think about the data, then we're actually in the other realm. You know, again, the, we have to form arguments and, and see if one is more coherent than another. You know, how to parse right. whatever the data is in front right. of you. Right. We we have hypotheses, right? And then right. we right. we build experiments or, or studies or research to to prove the hypothesis is correct or not. Right. Right. That, the science, it, it, it's really nice, you know, that, that part of that process is repeatability. Right. You know, like, in, again, in the courtroom, using that as an analogy, we, you know, you, you can't depend on that, unfortunately. It's just a different realm, but the, the goals are the same at, at any rate. Okay. Well, great. All Thank right. you very much. Thank you uh, very much for the call, and uh, mm -hmm. take care, and let's do this and say hello there. You're on the air. Hello, line one, you're on the air. Hello. Hi. Well, uh, my question is, he says he doesn't believe in ancient aliens, but what about the, you know, the drawings on the Mayan uh, pyramids where they got, you know, a spaceman and a spacesuit and a spaceship? Ancient aliens. You know, I, I, would, I would suggest that you go to either YouTube or directly the URL, Ancient Aliens Debunked. It's a three-hour video. It's free. It's got almost two and a half million views. And one of the segments is about just that, the, the so-called Palenque uh, astronaut. And I, I'd invite you to watch it. You can also go to the website and get a transcript of the actual video with you know, resources with sources where the, where the material was sourced. Basically, the what's been interpreted as, you know, hardware, rocketry, that sort of thing, really are known motifs from other pieces of Mayan art that are about the underworld. So it's not about ancient astronauts at all. Now, I know for the, someone who's committed to the ancient astronaut view, they're not really going to swallow that. Okay, but what I would say is, look, go back. This is a good, again, a teaching moment here. We want to understand the culture on their terms. They didn't make just this one object. They made lots of objects. Okay, and some of those objects have texts with them where you get the objects explained. Okay, underworld texts. So if you compare all of the data collectively, the ancient astronaut view of that particular artifact is going to disappear. And again, my argument is primary source based. Okay, when I was 10, I lived in Culver City, California. Mm -hmm. And there was a giant cigar-shaped, you know, craft that flew between my yard and the neighbor's yard. And so many people saw it, because it was on a weekend, that it was on the news. And they called it a runaway missile. And it was probably back in 1968. <laughs> but missiles don't have windows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's ridiculous. Yeah. So and it was so I, I would miles an hour. Yeah, I, I believe you entirely. I mean, I, I believe you saw what you saw, and you're not making mm -hmm. it up. My only question is, why would you conclude it's extraterrestrial? Uh, and again, because it's it's different. It's not what you'd normally see. But again, lots of people who know more about ufology than I do, you know, have gone through and cataloged all these sorts of objects and technology. I, I you know, I really recommend for this one, is, is triangle or otherwise. Again, to go to my website, drmsh.com, cl click on the quick links, and then look for my review of uh, Marler's book on uh, triangular UFOs. I pull out a lot of images, again, from patents and other technologies back into the really the turn of the century, the late 1890s, all the way up to today, for all the different shapes. 
And that doesn't mean that what you saw is not extraterrestrial. It just means that what you saw has a, has a really good explanation that might compete with that. And yeah, so that's why I'm saying I need more. I, I, need, a, I need a biological uh, entity you know, to, to move me to that position. Well, I saw a triangle, you know, in his hometown. I, I wish, I wish I would see one. I mean, I, you know, may, you know, true confessions here. Every time I go out and walk the dog, I mean, I look up at the sky, just hoping to see something, but I never have. So you've never, you've never seen anything, huh? But I've never seen anything. All right. Well, I think we've got another caller on the line. You're on the air with Mike Heiser. Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. How's it going? Just fine. Go right ahead. Uh, my question for you is. Um, the human body has a couple different parts that it's not used, and it's just kind of like your appendix and stuff like that. Do you think that maybe is there from the creator for a breathing apparatus in a different atmosphere or different Earth? And I'll take my question off the air. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, since, since I'm not an anatomist, I, I probably, you know, shouldn't be saying anything here, but I'll, I'll venture into this territory. Uh, my short answer would be that I've never read anything about vestigial organs like that. I have done a little reading about vestigial organs, uh, but nothing to that effect. I don't know how uh, you would get um, a breathing apparatus out of your appendix. You know, it, maybe if it was connected to the lungs or something, you know, you'd have some sort of argument there. But other than that, I'm not going to venture that much further into anatomy. All right. Uh, let's see. You're on the air with uh, Mike Heiser. Hello. Well, my control of these phones seems somewhat marginal. Hello there. <laughs> hey, how you doing? Okay, sir. Where are you? Um, I'm in Philly. Philadelphia. Okay. Yep. All right. Yep. Philadelphia. Okay, my question is, when I, when I listen to you, you know, with your theories and, 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 all, and your beliefs mm. and, you know, biblical times and the Bible, it kills me that black people have been just excluded from, from everything. And then and your source, which you probably would admit, is mostly lies and deception and things have been taken out and added to it. So where are you coming up with all this? Well, I, I am I am really glad you called. <laughs> Believe it or not, this is something I'm really interested in. The whole how the Bible was used to justify really terrible views of racism. And again, for your your listeners who are interested in this, and for the caller, I would recommend uh, getting a book called Adam's Ancestors. Okay, it's a scholarly book. It's dense, but you're going to love it because it shows where essentially how this happened. And it's not it's not an issue of what's in the Bible. It's an issue of how badly, how poorly people thought about the Bible in the wake of in the 1500s, you know, discovering new peoples and other continents, you know, the discovery of the new world. I mean, I, I agree with you. I, I, I think I think there's been horrific Bible interpretation that, ha, that has been foisted on not just the Christian community but on the African American community. That's just ridiculous and shameful, and it's, it's abominable. The Bible itself doesn't teach a lot of what people say it teaches, and this is one of the best examples in the world. Well, I'm, and I understand where you're coming from, but my, my point is also, like you said, when the Bible was put together in the 14th and 15th century, they excluded my people from almost everything. Well, everything, you know. And, and so when you do something, when you do something like that, how can you know now in the 21st century a person like you could speak, you know, with such authority about who the Creator is and and what took place during biblical time? You know, I feel like until I mean. You probably got a white Jesus hanging at your house, and until you get rid of that, how can you sit up here and talk about the Creator? I mean, it, it kills me. I mean, when I hear white people talk about religion, and I'm black, and they exclude my whole—I mean, I mean everything—and they talk with such authority, and I think almost arrogance. I mean, it, it, it just kills me. 
Well, I don't, I don't have a white Jesus. I have a Middle Eastern Jesus because that is the context for Jesus. The Bible doesn't talk about white Europeans. It knows nothing of Nordic races or white European races or anything like this. So what you're attacking and what you're upset with, I'd agree with you. Okay, it's just really crappy Bible interpretation. Uh, I don't know how else to put it, but the, these kinds of ideas that you're reacting against have come basically because people handled the Bible really, really badly. Now, I'll correct you on one point. It wasn't put together in the 14th and 15th centuries. I was referring to the Reformation. That's a, that's a Christian tradition. It has nothing to do with when the Bible was produced. It's much older than that. But it's a, it's a Mediterranean-centered document. It's an, it's an ancient Near Eastern-centered document. You can say blacks are excluded there are, there's actually more African-American material in the Bible than there is white European material. There's no white European material. It's a totally right. foreign world. Yes, hi. Um, hi, uh, Roswell Art. Um, this is a very interesting subject that I think that everybody contemplates at some point. Um, my question is, and it pertains to something that I've seen when I was younger, I've seen a... A creature that was obviously not human, but did contain, that did possess obvious technology, technology that was that was not inter- introduced to us until um, much later years. But what I okay, well, I, I want to know exactly. I want to know exactly what you saw. It, it, was this a humanoid type creature it, or what? This, this was a, a humanoid lizard type person. I was within lizard. four feet of it. I lived in the Midwest. In the Midwest, in the 1970s, we had no air conditioning units. You left your windows open in the in the summer times. Being a kid, the storm windows that you have, you know, to keep the bugs out. Mine was busted out from uh, basketball, so it was just basically an open window. I was I was sitting in bed. I'm a, I've always been a very light sleeper, and I found myself sitting up, and I was watching the back of a creature that was obviously lizard type creature um this creature i was fascinated but as a kid i don't think being a kid you get scared at just observing things um i observed this thing in fascination this this thing turned around and looked at me i looked right at its eyes and i didn't see eyes what i seen were were looked like glass bulbs that had a red tinge around the the very edge of it such as okay. what you would see maybe as night nighttime vision. I'm, I'm, that's hypothetical to me because I don't have that in my possession. I never had that in my possession. It's not evidence other than what I look back on and, and review it. All okay, right. You, say you, you, you said you were a kid. How old were you? I was 11 years old. 11 years old, and you were not asleep. I, I was not asleep. I was sitting up in my bed observing this as it was going through um the 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 items that I had on my dresser, and when this thing turned around and looked at me, um it probably looked at me for what seemed like a long time, but in reality it was probably two to three seconds. Now, this is where people think that and they laugh at me that it's hokey pokey. This thing took uh its hand, which did have fingers. I don't recall how many fingers it had, and they weren't like dexterous fingers like human fingers. It was actually like animal-type fingers, and it touched a yellow belt that it was wearing, and I watched this thing disappear. Okay? Now, I don't know how much time had passed, but I then, like, regained a, a consciousness my closet door was open, and this same creature was rummaging around in my closet. Um, I was still not panicked because it, it was moving slow. Uh, this thing did turn, you know, and observe me. It was ob- observing my condition of, my, of me observing it. Once it observed that I had seen it again, this thing moved so fast that it was like, it was like a strobe light, and it leaped right out that open window and that's when I panicked as a kid I panicked when it moved fast when it didn't move fast I was able to observe it with fascination I I then screamed ran to my parents room my parents came opened 
um, you know, turned on the light, looked around. My closet door was obviously open. Things had been strewn out of it and whatever. I slept in my parents' room. They didn't believe me. Uh, the, the, the next morning, I, I checked on everything that I could find, you know, that might be disturbed in my room. Earlier that day, in the 1970s, the, the elderly people that lived next door to me, they had a yard sale, and I bought a, a huge Rand McNally dictionary for $1. That's the only thing I could find that was missing from my room. Besides, there was a mess that, that I hadn't made. All right. Well, um, what, do you, what do you think you encountered? Do you think you encountered uh, something demonic or something yes, alien? No. No, I, I, I don't think I encountered something demonic, and I don't necessarily think I experienced anything that was extraterrestrial because I didn't see any kind of a, a flying object or anything, but I did see. Okay, well, let me rephrase it. What do you think technology. you what What do you think you did encounter? <laughs> I I think I encountered that some sort of um, secretive subculture that has technology that observes or was trying to learn more about us and uh, gathering information. And here's where what happened. The, the very next night, I I waited for this thing. I sat up all night waiting for this thing to come through my window with a baseball bat. I know it sounds okay. crazy. We're short <laughs> on time here, so did it come in or not? No, but the third night, no. I was getting a drink of Kool-Aid, and, and I seen um, my, my mother had a plant that had toothpicks in it. It was a potato plant sitting in the windowsill in the kitchen. I was drinking Kool-Aid, and I seen the hand come up and lift that thing up up out of that, and I looked out, I peeked out, and I got scared because of the previous experience. Yes. And, and I seen this thing packing this thing into a, a, a cardboard box. This thing then picked that cardboard box up, looked at me now for the second time that it had seen me. Our garage was detached. This thing, this thing took about four steps and leaped up on the top of our garage and walked off towards the back where I couldn't see it. I couldn't wait until the next morning to get out there and climb up on top of the garage to see if there was some sort of fort, a nest, or anything. There was no evidence. There was nothing. Okay, well, it sounds to me like you drank the Kool-Aid, all right. Um, Mike, <laughs> uh, yeah, laugh, I know, but people have these encounters sure. absolutely he described you know, a creature that was lizard like mm -hmm. into what category pray tell would you put that <laughs> well you know the 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 not shocking answer is i don't know what the guy saw uh i mean i could i could uh, take up the time and go through the four or five different categories of you know people who've you know studied abduction research and the so-called, you know, old hag and, you know, the, the, the night terrors and all this stuff and come up with categories that this could go into. But ultimately, I don't know what the guy saw. Mike, does your I'll, philosophy I'll, allow for de demons, demonic entities? Yeah, I, I, I believe in a, in a you know, non-material, since I'm a theist, I'm not a materialist. I believe in the so-called, you know, for lack of a better term, spiritual world. You know, non-human intelligences that are disembodied and all that kind of stuff. I'm going to say something. This might be a little controversial here. Well, you're already you know, controversial. I mean, yeah. in what you believe and demand evidence for versus what, what you have faith in and don't. If, for them. If this, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. If this happened to somebody that I knew personally, we had a good relationship, the first thing I would want to know was, were you living near a military installation or do you have near relatives in the military? Now, the reason it's controversial is, as I will confess, I have been influenced by the work of people like Leah Haley, who believe a lot of this stuff, you know, the, the whole MyLab thing. Um, you know, for somebody like her who was deeply entrenched in abduction research and, and this sort of stuff, um, for her to take the position she does now and for the reason she does, that would be really, really, really on the forefront of my mind. Uh, again, if this happened to me or somebody, you know, that I, that I particularly knew, but ultimately the honest, you know, answer is I don't really know what the guy saw. I think there could be a interdimensional realities, spiritual realities. I mean, it's all vocabulary we have to use for this non-material 
world. Again, I'm not a materialist, so I, I believe these things, you know, could exist. But I, you know, if, if you're going to put it in the extraterrestrial category, I'd like to first know that there are, you know, such biological entities as opposed to, you know, some other description, non-biological okay. description. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. You are on the air with Mike Heiser. Hello. Hello, Art. Yes. Hey, uh, Roswell. First time caller. Uh, I'm this west from northern Michigan right now. Uh, I just wanted to ask your your, your guest what his uh, ideas, his thoughts are on other dimensions, higher dimensions, and okay. which is something that really cannot be proved, actually. And if he does believe in a God, does does he not believe? Does he or does he not believe uh, if it's like a multi-dimensional being, which in itself means that it cannot be proved. All right, let's start with the dimensions. Um, theoretical physics sure. right now thinks there may be 11. What do you think? I don't see any reason to deny that there would be, you know, more than all these dimensions. I mean, you know, I, the caller's right. I mean, you don't, you can't, you know, you, you can't necessarily prove these things. Again, they're mm -hmm. postulates and there are ways you can sort of attack the problem that make it more or less coherent but i mean i don't i don't see anything problematic about it i mean who who ultimately knows um you know yeah if 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 there is a god that god that deity could by definition uh exist outside our time and space and, and intrude upon our time and space you know come and go all that sort of thing i, I don't have any problem with those suggestions by the world of physics you know theoretical physics Okay, and about... Okay, thank uh, you. All right, you're very welcome. Take care. Or God could exist across all of those dimensions. Sure. I mean, we, we just don't... We don't know. Okay, first time... Not first time. What am I talking about? You're on the air with Mike Heiser. Hello. One number, many people. Hello? Hi. Hello. Hi. My Hello. question... Hello, yeah, go ahead, hon. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. My question is this, and, and kudos, Roswell, and hello, Mike. Um, uh, this stuff that's going on in the Middle East, does that make the Christianity, Muslim fighting a moot point that the Bible really doesn't matter much other than a directional? And my other, in addition to that, do you think that... Okay, hold, hold on. Hold on for the answer to that question. I'm not sure I got it straight. Mike? Yeah, I don't. I'm not quite sure what the caller's asking either. Um, right. Okay. You Again, please. What are you asking about the Middle East? Well, with the Muslims and all their fighting, and they're saying that they have to beat the Christians and this, this. Does it really? I mean, where does that fall into theology and um, the God image and the whole? ball of wax, is, is that a um, moot point? Is it useless? I mean, is it just something they're taking to extreme for no reason? I'm not sure I'm getting it still. Uh, well, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. I'm, go ahead. Know, again, I'm not, I'm not quite sure either. If the question is, is all this stuff in the Middle East now about Bible prophecy, uh, I, I'm one that would say no. I, I don't really see a, a, a real one-to-one -one connection there if it's something bigger than that that you know yeah there's fighting and there's wars and i mean jesus did talk about that this is going to go on and on and on well then there's that connection but i'm not quite sure what she's asking beyond that yeah it's it, it, it more or less in that ball right there what you had just said the answer my other my other thing was to do with creation is mm -hmm. do you think do you think that with our higher intellect, that that is basically, um, not to be rude, but you could take a redneck and try to explain something to them, and they're not getting it, whereas you could take a, a scholar and it's the most simplest thing to them. Do you think that our intellect allows us to see these other dimensions and things that other people wouldn't comprehend? Yeah, I don't. I don't see how how someone's grasp of of this or that piece of content, in other words, their intelligence. I don't see any correlation of that being some sort of gateway to, you know, seeing other dimensions. So I guess that's the best way I can answer that. 
Okay, very good. Uh, you are on the air with Mike Heiser. Uh, now you're on the air, I think. Hello. Hey, this is Tunzi. Hi there. Um, I had a question about the UFOs. Well, one-third of the angels fell with Satan. Could the UFOs be manifestations of the angels? Because they're not leaving sonic boom, they're not leaving vapor trails or anything, so could it be just the manifestations? that they have projecting onto us as a way to deceive us from God. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm just waiting to see if you were done. Oh yeah. Oh well, this this will this will open up a can of worms here. First, I don't I don't actually believe that uh, there's any passage in in the Bible that says one third of the angels fell with Satan. That comes from Revelation 12, but the comment about the third of the stars is actually uh, in connection with the first coming of Jesus. So it's not. The, the whole idea of an angelic rebellion, as far as the Bible goes, I think is something of a myth. Um, so you can you can tell I'll I'll get some good email out of that one. Oh, I'm sure you will. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I do believe that there are angels and you know demons and all this kind of stuff. I just don't believe that particular thing. But let's just set that to the side. The whole thing about UFOs and angels. To, to me, when we talk about UFOs, we're talking about craft about entities that are humanoid. Angels in the Bible are always you know, depicted in human appearance, which is quite different than these craft. They don't need craft. Uh, again, if this is an, a, an interdimensional reality, you don't need nuts and bolts technology to carry you from one place you know, to another. There, if you have command over dimensional passage, uh, you don't need to get into anything that's going to burn fuel to get you there. All right. Um, let's see. You're on the air with Mike Heiser. Hello. Hello. Hi. You got me? I hey. got you. Hey, this is Billy. How y'all doing today? Fine, Good. Billy. Good. I got a couple. I got a couple questions. I got a point to. I got a point to make. And uh, first of all, you, you've read that you're all over the. We're all over the page here. First, you know, first thing you get. <laughs> First, we get we got a creator, which is which is the Lord, right? Okay. So you, you want you need a biological point. Well, let's just say here, if a, if a alien kidnapped us and was he was hijacking us, would you think that he would need a biological point too? You know, it, everything is, is is molecular and made up by molecular. And if you have a creator, the creator uh, made the, the molecular for it. You know what I'm saying? Okay, Mike, uh, you're, is, you're, uh, Mike, is, you're, Mike if, uh, you're breathing into the phone. Uh, okay. Okay, there you go. Go ahead, Mike. Um, this is why I'm a dualist. Can I, can I, you know, I, I raise my two other points? Go ahead. Now that I'll leave you alone here. Okay. With the, with the, uh, the uh, African-American that was talking earlier, now if you read in the Bible then when it had... Uh, when they had Cain and Abel, and, a and Cain killed Abel, right? Well, mm -hmm. the Lord came to Cain, and he put a mark on his body, and he said that, that that he will be recognized from now on with this mark. Now, could you believe that's where black people came from? But also, no. when, when he sent them out in different tribes, remember? When he had the land of Babel, okay? They sent, uh, he sent them all out in different tribes. Now, that's how we get separation of uh, race of racist not racist but racist all right can I can I interject there sure okay uh, no I don't believe that the Cain and Abel story has anything to do with black people okay with African American race or the Negro race there there are no physical characteristics attached to any of the tribes or nations in the table of nations in Genesis 10. Up until the 20th century, okay, well, late 19th century, let, let's be generous here, race was defined 
in terms of language and religion. And that's the way it always was in the Bible. You defined a person's race by what language they spoke and what God they worshipped. That was separated. Okay, those things were separated, severed, to make a biological argument by, believe it or not, the Nazis, okay, early Nazi thinking because of their wish to identify a particular biological set of characteristics with what they perceived to be an original race. So, again, we... The, the Bible doesn't doesn't reason that way because they didn't know anything about science. They're not doing biology. You know, nowadays we, we go by genetic lineage and differentiation. You know, we're more sophisticated than they were in the 19th century and certainly in, in you know, real primitive times, the second millennium B.C. or something like that. So I, I think a lot of this racial theory, this racial talk that people try to attach to the Bible, like I told the uh, African American caller, is really misguided, and it's really contrary to the, to the biblical world. But, uh, yes, well, they, but you know when they split them up it, it, uh, to the different tribes, when there was the Moses walking around, they split them all up in different tribes. Then they brought, you know, then they had the land of Babel, which was, uh, you know, if I can get pulled over. Uh, the, uh, well, if you, if you go back and look at the table of nations, they're not all, all those names are not actually people. Some of them are locations. Some of them are tribal groups. Sure, um, sure. You know, some of them are geographical regions and things like that. So, uh, again, it, it, I I would suggest that it's because of a very careless reading. Uh, again, this goes back to the late 19th century of passages like Babel that we get a lot of the racism. Uh, that we've been living through in the 20th century and still in the 21st century. And, and the, the Bible just doesn't think on those terms because it wasn't about physical characteristic. It was about language and about, again, which, you know, which part of divine turf are you on and who, what God do you worship and that sort of thing. So my, my view of these passages is really linked to the biblical world itself and not, you know, what Christians or, or Jews or Aryans or whoever, Europeans, did with the Bible uh, in later times. Uh, okay. What do you think about the, uh, you were saying you were needing a biological uh, proof. What biological proof would it take for you to be, to uh, gain your faith and to believe? Well, this is an excellent question, yes. and I'm going to have to be a little careful here because it actually takes me into sequel territory. I'm, I'm almost done with the sequel to the facade, which is called the portent. Yes. So I'll I'll try not to dance too badly here. <laughs> but <laughs> let me let me say it this way: um, it would be sufficient to me to either have something microbial, the elements of which could not come from Earth, in other words, non-terrestrial, clearly non-terrestrial elements, something that's microbial or bigger that had to go by the same set of criteria, again, non-terrestrial stuff. Now, the problem is, if, you've ever, if you know what synthetic biology is, and if your listeners are interested in this or want to find out about it, look at the book called Regenesis. It's by the guy who teaches genetics at Harvard. Synthetic biology means not only can we read DNA, but we can write it from the atomic level on up. And what that means is that in our near future, 10, 20, 30 years out, we will be actually able to create DNA that has never existed before and cannot exist on Earth. Now, if you have someone that can do that, they can actually fake best evidence. And that, that's the problem. Again, since I, I read a lot of this weird stuff, this weird technology stuff, it's a little scary because since I'm, I'm into ufology, I take the whole paranoia of the, of the military-industrial complex pretty seriously. Uh, I'm suspicious of it. I'm suspicious of the black world. And if they're talking about this at Harvard, I know they're talking about it at other places. And so it's a little frightening for me. So I'm being honest with you. That would do it for me. But in the back of my mind, I'd still be wondering, okay, is this real or did somebody make it 
to almost create like a, a uh, almost like a genetic Photoshop. It, it's even worse. It, look, if you, nowadays we could we <laughs> think of what you could do, Art. If you if you have some, you have the ability to write your own DNA, you just make it up. Mm-hmm. And that, and now marry that to 3D printers, that that idea, and again that that piece of technology. I mean, it, it's really frightening. It is just honest to goodness frightening that if someone wanted to, they could do that kind of thing to move people towards certain sets of beliefs that would put them in, in situations where their behavior was predictable to steer them in certain directions. Yeah, I wonder what I mean, you're going to do then, I just, Mike. I, I, I'm serious. What are you going to do then? When, I, when, when somebody can come forth with a creature that they have, in essence, created, mm-hmm. and they're going to present it to you, and, and you're, you're going to have biological evidence in front yeah, of your I, eyes, then what? This is, this is why I write fiction. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I like, I want to confront myself with that problem. Um, you know, it. The, the, the honest answer is, I, I don't know. You know, I, be, I would, I would sort of be predisposed to thinking, okay, this is probably real. I'm, I'm probably being too paranoid again to think that someone would have this kind of power and would want to wield it for. You know what? You know God only knows what purpose. Again, but mm. I'm just telling you, maybe I've been in ufology too long, but I, I just have this strong, you know, again, suspicion that, you know, if I can think these thoughts, people who are a lot <laughs> smarter than me can think these thoughts too. Okay. You know, and, and it's kind of a dilemma. All right. Um, hello there. You're on the air with Mike Heiser. Hello. Hi. Hello. How are you doing, hey. Art? Fine. <laughs> I love your show. Your show is so wonderful and inspiring. I have a real great question for, uh, oh, what's his Mike name? Heiser. Hi, Mike Heiser, yes. You have just explained a whole lot of things that would basically, mm. a belief in God. Uh, I, I, I get to the first part when, when I started holding here is, you were saying that there was a DNA struggle between science and uh, uh, theology uh, created from Adam and Eve. It couldn't be done with just a couple, and then it went to Moses, and they had four sets. But it doesn't explain the fact that we have discovered in the past uh, cavemen, Cro-Magnums, Neanderthals that preexisted Adam and Eve with their DNA. Uh, why, why would why would we assume that they pre-existed Adam and Eve? Because they're going back millions and millions of years ago. And, and why would we presume that Adam and Eve couldn't as well? Well, that, that's where I'm, you know, I'm not a theologist or a Ph.D. or a scholar or anything like well, you that. Know, you, don't, you don't need, you don't need just, to be. <laughs> but I'm just, I'm just. In listening to you, and you're saying just just now here recently of someone being able to write a DNA. Uh, well, I keep listening to this show, and I look up in the stars and all the vast universe and all the stars and billions and billions upon trillions, and it's like infinity up there. And I'd have to be pretty naive to think that we were the only little speck in the infinite world that their life exists as we know it. You know, I would assume that there was something somewhere in some far away galaxy or whatever. How come they haven't reached that technology that they can write DNA as that? Oops, made a mistake. I'm gonna throw it over here on this rock. Let it, let it, <laughs> let it grow. You know, yeah. and see what happens. So, in 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 the way you're describing it to me is, there's my God. He just created us. So who is he? Who created him? Someone did the same thing to them and threw them on a rock and let them grow. You know, I, I don't understand. Well, that, I can go home. You know, what, yeah. What what you're what you're doing is you're is you're taking points of data. You're you're taking you know specific ideas, and you are connecting them again, which is a normal impulse. But the question is, is that connection coherent? Is it compelling? Is it the only connection that can be made? And the answer to all three of those is no, no, and no. So. I wouldn't be too disturbed over the fact that you can think those connections. That doesn't make them real. 
Uh, I certainly would not say that because we can do something now that somebody did before back in Adam and Eve. I have no basis to make that sort of statement, and nobody else does either. Okay, all we're describing is, to, to be really, really blunt about it, and I think, you know, based on other guests that Art has had and now and in the past, we're going to get ourselves in a whole lot of trouble because we seem to be hurtling toward this, you know, fulfilling this impulse, which isn't a good one. That is to be as gods. And, you know, that, that's what, what, what frightens me. It's not the idea that, that we can do this and now I'm going to project that back into the remote past and that, that must be why we're here. And my concern is really the here and now, uh, that, that we are at this point where we're entertaining some of these thoughts. And again, I, I, I am not predisposed to thinking that people in power who have these technologies are only thinking about wonderful ways to use them. Mike, does it scare you to hear um, what, what people embrace and believe these days? Boy, that, that, that's probably your most loaded question of the night. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it does. Uh, and, and part of the reason it does is, is not necessarily the conclusion. I mean, that, you know, this person's a theist, this person's a not, this person's a Christian, this person's not. What really frightens me, and, and you know, the way you ask that question, is that people often believe things and the path that they take to get there makes absolute no, absolutely no sense at all. In other words, they don't check for evidence. They don't test. They don't probe this connection to that connection. They just move to the next connection. The people seem to be, and I think part of this is the information explosion. There's so much out there, and it's so wearying to think that I have to think about all this stuff. So there, there, there's this propensity to sort of just, take a narrative and, and I like it and I'm going to go with it and that's where I'm at. So it's this unexamined, you know, unprobed sets of ideas that just sort of get jumbled together and people come out somewhere on the other end. Because if, if, if that's the way you're thinking, you can be led to believe almost anything. That's the scariest thing you've said all night, Art. <laughs> Man, it, it, it's, it's really scary. It really is because there's just no... There's no filter, you know, there, and, and you marry that to the real suspicion of authority, you know, that, that this generation, you know, has, that's growing up with the Internet, has. Oh, that it's, I, I'm not all, it's not all their fault. It's not all the Internet's it's fault. Not, um, I, I you know, know authority began to go out the window with Richard Nixon. That's true. That, that's true. You know, and we, we are living, unfortunately, we're living on the very bad capital of a lack of leadership, a lack, a lack of ethics, a lack of trustworthiness, and it, you, you marry that to access to lots of information, and I don't really care to have you help me sift it. I'm going to do it myself, and mm. it's just a free-for-all. You know, it, it really is. I remember when I was 13 or 14, Mike, um, you could go to the TV, and one day uh, the news would come on, and a guy from the FBI would come to the podium, and he would tell you this or that. And it was like gold. I mean, everybody just flat believed it. If the FBI said it, hey, baby, it was true. Today, yep, yep. the exact opposite is true. If, if, if some sort of government official, and by the way, the government did close <laughs> by government. Uh, if some government official comes <laughs> to the mic and says something, uh, people almost automatically disbelieve it. Yep, yep. Yeah. You know, to use a biblical phrase, we are reaping what we have sown. Apparently. You're on the air with Mike Heiser. Hello. Hi, Art. Hi. I have a question for Dr. Heiser. Mm -hmm. This is Josh in Utah. Um, have you ever considered the possibility that some UFOs might be from ancient civilizations, considering the things that were <laughs> built back then? No, oh, yes, Mike, Mike thinks about that all the time. He thinks, uh, yeah. right? Uh, yeah, I, I would say not on the basis of things that are that are built. Um, a, a lot of people, a lot of people really don't. Again, I, I know it's boring. Okay, I'll admit that. But a lot of people don't really spend the time to read the high-level, dense, detailed stuff 
you know, by specialists like in ancient engineering and technology that, you know, are put out in what we call in academia the fugitive literature that only people in the guild are going to read. But I, I do read a lot of that stuff, and I don't think we need aliens to explain the pyramids and bail back and all these sorts of things. But having said that, I thought you were going to go with to time travel uh, with the question. You know, and again, no, uh, I mean, time travel might be possible, but, you know, there's other theories out there. Yeah, I mean, if, let's say that, that, you know, science, you know, physicists at some point were able to, you know, really nail this down. It was possible, not only possible, but, you know, we know it can be done. And then the question comes, well, did somebody else figure this out and do it? I mean, that's, again, it's a different kind of question, but I actually think that's worth more time thinking about than stuff like the ancient alien view puts out. I mean, to me, that there's more of a rational basis for that, assuming we ever get that point of knowledge that it's real. The only the only thing that bothers me about you, Mike, is that you you seem to have one standard of proof for anything alien, whether contemporary or ancient, and another standard of proof for anything that is biblical or involves creation or the creator. Oh, I don't I don't think so. I think I think you can actually I think I'm actually pretty simple. I proceed from some really simple assumptions. Well, you dan you dance well, Mike. You, you dance well. No, I, I I'm trying to be honest. I'm trying to let your listeners understand the way I think. I'm I'm uh, trying to be honest too. Right. I'm trying trying to be well, honest. I'm just giving you my observation. Right. And that that's fine. You know, for a, a, a biological entity, I need biological mm. proof. Mm -hmm. And God isn't a biological entity. I don't think we can prove God. So we're left to, you know, Happy. philosophical arguments, you know, mm -hmm. what's more Happy. coherent as opposed to what isn't. Mm -hmm. okay. So again, I, I, don't, I don't have blind faith. All right. Uh, you're on there I want with, faith uh, to be reasonable. With the man who doesn't have blind faith. Hello. <laughs> Hello, gentlemen. <laughs> Yes. Uh, well, we segued off in the DNA, and I wish I'm going to be a little bit vague because I don't remember the professor that, that wrote this book, but he wrote a book for college on chemical evolution. And as I understood him, he said for a while that was like the given textbook uh, used to explain chemical evolution across the country. And then one of his students challenged him or brought up the question, as to where does information come from? Where does the information that's in the DNA actually evolve from? Mm -hmm. and, and I guess I'd be interested um, uh, just in your, your thoughts on that, Art, your thoughts on that, and that I think he was saying, you know, for life to exist, it takes DNA. For, for, the, for initial life to exist, it takes DNA to, to you know, as a blueprint to build life. And so prior to life, what would be the precursor to DNA that would even, um, well, I guess, you know, where would the DNA come from? And again, as complex and as sophisticated as it appears to be, I mean, this is, this is a, a blueprint uh, tied up in, you know, a, a microscopic piece of biology. And, and, and this challenged his, uh, this professor's belief that, Evolution, uh, life could exist without a creator, but when he, when the student got him thinking about that, it, it got him rethinking as to, you know, evolution and origins. And I do apologize, I don't recall this, this professor's name. It's been about a year since I looked at his material. <laughs> Well, that, that, that's a design argument, and in, in fairness to the people who don't accept intelligent design, they would more or less say, well, we, you know, we know all about that particular argument, and that before you have DNA, you have to have elements, and they have to come together to form DNA as we know it. But they, they will attribute that to, uh, again, even though it looks designed, they'll attribute it to a process that does not have a creator behind it. You know, and, and that, that's sort of illustrative of where the argument's at. You know, it is, you know, first of all, do we have design? You know, we're looking at this and we think it's design because, holy cow, it's, it's incredibly complex. Is this design or is it random? And, that, and at that point, it becomes a philosophical argument. Which one makes more sense? 
Okay, that's what I mean by these philosophical arguments. Which one is just, just makes more sense? Which one's more coherent? You know, and you'll find people on both sides of that, which is why we have a debate over intelligent design. That's right. Okay, you're on the air with Mike Heiser. Hello. Hi, Mike. I, I Hi. Uh, really enjoyed the conversation. I guess I come from a very different kind of thinking. Um, I'm from continental philosophy schools like Jacques Derrida and some of the deconstructionist thinkers. So mm -hmm. I guess uh, I'm approaching all of your notions a little differently. But um, mm -hmm. I guess I have a little problem with the point you made where you said you're disturbed by the fact that people's path to belief makes no sense at all. It seems to me that <laughs> its very definition is that. So, you know, if you have faith in something, that's a path to belief that makes no sense. You, you are taking a leap. So I, I, would ag I would agree. I would agree if the, if the path is full of unreasonable conclusions and arguments. Well, let me, let me make a, an argument about time then. Um, from some of the thinkers that I read, the, the notion of time itself um, requires a kind of relational thinking, where the, the present moment is a relation mm -hmm. of past to future, um, so the now is never available to us immediately, which means that presence itself is a problem. The sovereign subject, the, the person that's in control of, you know, thinking itself. If you're a dualist thinker, you're holding on to the idea that there is a sovereign subject that is present in the now. And I would argue that that's a kind of irrational thinking. Well, I, I would say that, that <clears throat> the fact that we cannot come to grips or cannot explain that now uh, is is one thing as far as that being the you know the taking that inability and drawing a conclusion from it like you've just drawn i don't know that that's necessarily uh, coherence it seems like an argument from our inability but i mean someone who and, I, and i'm not saying i i take this position this whole god outside of time thing which has some significant problems which you're probably already aware of but it also has, you know, its adherence, you know, within cosmology and philosophical theology that the arguments sort of aren't really relevant to a being such as that. And so the, the path that you've taken to demonstrate that this being is in this moment that doesn't exist, that moment wouldn't exist in our dimension, if we can use that term, whereas it would not be relevant in a different dimension. I mean, there's any number of, again, I'm not saying I'm married in these positions, but I'm, I'm trying to illustrate for the audience that there are, there are other ways to take the same set of ideas and wind up somewhere else. I, um, I guess I would argue that, that thinking itself occurring within this kind of time, uh, any, any notion that there's something outside of that, if you're arguing for like a, a God that exists outside of time, is, is unthinkable and in some sense nihilistic because it's opposed to life, which occurs within time, and that's the way we experience it. So wanting something outside of time is in a sense a kind of nihilism or denial of life. And I, and I, I would agree that that's, that's a good argument against it. I don't, I don't argue that God is outside of time. I would argue that God can be in our time or he cannot be. I mean, it, in other words... But if God's in our time, this is a radically different God than a traditional Christian God. Now we're talking well, about... It, 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 might be, it might be radically different. Uh, than the Christian thinkers you're you're thinking of or accustomed to, but I'll give you an example, uh, and it gets really. You're, you sound like the guy that would enjoy this this sort of reading. Uh, if you go up to William Lane Craig's homepage, he he spends a lot of his career, frankly, on this God and time sort of thing, showing that hey, it's really kind of theologically scary to have God completely outside of time. And and one of the arguments is just exactly what you said. Another one would be, if God exists out of time, then how can he really empathize with our experience? And that has implications for things like prayer and, and whatnot. So a lot of Christian theologians are not where you're putting them. Is, is what the what, what makes you think he has anything to do with our experience at a macro level anyway? Again, that, that that's just a theological statement, and you could approach it two ways. You could say, well, the Bible says that, and, you know, that, that would be one argument. You know, the other way to look at it is reasoning from the analogy of ourselves, and that is, well, if I would have made things, it seems more reasonable that if I made something, I'd like to at least watch it if not spend time with it, as opposed to not. And so, again, that, that's where the philosophical argument lands, and that's, that's the ground on which it's fought. 
Okay, well, thanks a lot. I really appreciate the conversation. Uh, you bet. Me too. Take care. Uh, here's somebody, Shep, who says, Mike, Mike says that a lot of people's path to belief makes no sense. But faith is itself, by definition, a path to belief that does not make sense. Isn't his fundamentalism caught up in the same problem? Right. Well, first, I'm not a fundamentalist. The people who fired me from my last teaching job would certainly say I'm not. Um, so I'm not in that camp. And I think that's the same question that the, the, the previous caller just asked. That's right. That, that's right. I mean, basically, yeah, it's true. I'm going to sit, go out on a limb and say it's true that not all beliefs are equally coherent. Not all paths to a certain conclusion are equally coherent. I don't think that's really going out too far on a limb. Okay, I can believe that, that pink bunny rabbits, you know, invaded the earth millions of years ago. Okay, I believe it. Does that make it coherent? No, it doesn't. They're not all the same. Okay. Uh, you're on the air with Mike Heiser. Hello. Uh, yes. Is this Mr. Art Bell? It is. <clears throat> Hello, Art Bell. Um, Roswell's T, sir. I'd like thank to thank you for your uh, services and all the um, uh, entertainment you gave us over the years. Thank you, mm -hmm. sir. Okay. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Michael, um, Dr. Michael, excuse me. I've got a question. In the Bible, it says that, uh, it says that, uh, man was all, was created, uh, was created in the image of us. Uh, uh, speaking of God, I guess. When he says us, what does he mean by that? I mean, when he says, uh, is there more than one God? Or, or, or what, what, what does that, what does it mean when he says a man was in created, created in the image of us? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'll answer you quickly, but just so that you know, if you go to my website, drmsh.com, go to the quick links and click on the quick link page to click on the word Elohim, and you'll get this answer written out so you don't have to try to remember it. The let us create humankind in our image, again, these plurals are well known. They are what's called grammatically the plural of exhortation. If I walk into a room and I say, hey, let's go get pizza, I am a single speaker speaking to a group. This is exactly the same thing that's happening in Genesis. God is speaking to who? Well, I would say the heavenly host, the angels, whatever, the, the inhabitants of the spiritual world, whatever. It says, hey, I have a great idea. Let's make humankind in our image. Now, that plural implies that the image, whatever that is, and I have my own view of that, that you can read about, is shared between God and these other beings, the heavenly host, angels, whatever, Elohim, whatever, and humans. There's something shared there. Again, I think the image is not a quality like sentience or thought or prayer or whatever. I think it's a status. I think it's, it has to do with representation, ruling representation. We are God as though he were here. We are his representatives. It's equally shared. And the angels are God's representatives in whatever domain God gives them, okay? That's the short answer. So I'm a single speaker. I'm speaking to a group, and in the case of Genesis, when the creation actually happens, God created humankind in his image. There's a singular pronoun, and the verb is singular, and the subject is singular. There is only a single creator in Genesis 1, but that creator announces it to a group. And here's where I depart, obviously, from Sitchin, and even in the in the Mesopotamian text, the Anunnaki, if you actually go and look at the Atrahasis epic, Enuma Elish, the Anunnaki do not create humankind, but they are in the room. They're watching. A single deity does the creation. So there's a relationship there, but not the one that Sitchin is going to argue for or did argue for. All right. Uh, you're on the air with Mike Heiser. Hello. Uh, hey, Ari Roswell. Thank you. Uh, Mike? <laughs> yes. Uh, my name is Mike, too. I guess two Mike Simmons don't make a right, huh? <laughs> uh, I would agree. Uh, if God created uh, everything, then who or what created God? And I'll take my answer off there. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> You're very welcome. Uh, well, my answer, since I'm a theist and a dualist, is that there was nothing before, you know, God. So, again, that's that's a philosophical position. I don't believe that in the, like, string theory or universes burping other universes into existence answers this question at all. All it does is set up an infinite regress. 
You know, well, what about the universe before that one? And what about the one before that one? It doesn't really do anything. You know, so we're, we're back to the, are we monists or are we dualists? You know, that kind of thing. I once heard somebody say something that I found fascinating, and it was that um, in the beginning there was God and only God. And mm -hmm. that um, he, in essence, became lonely and so blew himself up. And that was the Big Bang. And we are all, therefore, a part of God. Right. That, that randomly is... tossing that out there. Right. No, that, no biological actually... proof for you. No, I, I know. But that's actually Gnosticism, which doesn't mean it's a bad word. And if you hold that position, Art, here's, here's something for you to wrestle with, because I, I remember you talking about that and, and you finding some real, you know, there's an emotional impact, you know, that that you know, had with you, that you, you really like that argument. But if you hold that, you have to be a materialist. In other words, you don't really have a consciousness outside of the material world, because if God is everything and everything is God, there is nothing outside the material creation. And I don't know if you want to go there intellectually. I mean, obviously you can. But I've heard a lot of content on your show that would suggest to me that you do think consciousness is different than the material world. Now, maybe it may maybe be. I'm, I, I'm open. I'm open to proof, Mike. Right. You're on the air with Mike Heiser. Good morning. Evening, Good morning, guys. Whatever. Well, it's morning here. Morning. Hey. Yes. Um, I'm going to try to be pretty concise with my question and hope I don't lose my train of thought on the way. Um, I probably don't believe in God the same way you believe in God, and I definitely don't believe in religion the same way you do. I'm kind of a Taoist in that I think the God you can name is not God. And mm -hmm. so my question is kind of a comment. It, I do believe that I have come in contact with something that is what you would call a higher intelligence because what I experienced, it manipulated you know, the physical world that I experience every day in its own way. And I experienced it the same way I would experience you face-to-face. -face. So I know it's out there. I don't know what it is. But it got me to think that if there is a higher intelligence such as this, wouldn't it be easy for them? And if it's not easy, wouldn't it at least be interesting for them to manipulate our world to make them appear godlike? That doesn't mean they are God but they certainly could appear that way to us. And one of the things that got me thinking on this direction is I have a friend who's, who's certain that he met Jesus in a vision, and he wants to tell everybody about it. Mm -hmm. You know, I had what you might call a vision, but I'm not going around saying that Jesus or Krishna or any other god came to me. Something I witnessed, I don't know what it was, mm -hmm. it opened my eyes up. So how so? How can you trust anything you see? When I listen to you talk, I think the only thing certain are death and taxes. Everything else is just a way to cope, right? <laughs> uh, the old, yeah, the old bromide. Uh, in, in answer to your first question, could they, these higher intelligence, appear godlike? I would say yes. So that that's a fairly straightforward question. Uh, I'm wondering... Is this something that you experienced, this higher intelligence, do you assign personhood to it? Was it a person? Well, I'll tell you. My grandma and I both saw it, and we, she, was, she, was, she believed it may have been my grandfather who died before I was born. Mm -hmm. We both mm -hmm. experienced something paranormal. Um, I just experienced something very strange. It was a light, and it had mm -hmm. form, and it was a real, it was a thing. She experienced a light, but it had a different appearance to her. So her impression, she's a very religious person, by the way, so I was surprised mm -hmm. that she didn't come out of it with a, as a religious experience, but she felt that it was her husband, Bob, my grandfather. Mm -hmm. I got no impression from it other than that it was not of, <laughs> I can't say it was not, not of this world, because obviously it was of this world, mm -hmm. but it was not something that, uh, you know, performed according to the nine-year-old physics that I knew at the time, and never mm -hmm. has. So there's something else out there. I know this. I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. Even though you you didn't get an impression, <clears throat> I, right. I hope you don't mind the conversation here. I'm just I'm curious. No. Uh, even even though you didn't get an impression, mm -hmm. would you? Does that rule out? Uh, 
a person, you know, in other words, personhood for this thing or whatever it was to you? I, I'm, I'm no, wondering not you at all. I, out. Okay. In person, in what form? I got the impression that it was intelligent. Absolutely. Did I get the impression yeah. that it was human or that it spoke to me in any way? No. Right. I just got the It would be like... Um, Maybe a lower form, if we're a lower form of life, it'd be like pulling a fish out of water and saying, hey, fish, mm -hmm. and that fish would be like, I, what are you? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's another form of life. I would say that. And it was bright white. It was the whitest light I have ever seen. But it didn't, it was, it was pure white. So you would think it had all the hallmarks of a religious experience, but I did not mm -hmm. get, if anything, it made me less religious and more open-minded to the fact that we are not the end-all, be-all. Right. The, re the reason I ask, and, and the, the, the way I'm thinking about personhood, I, I should have been clear, uh, I'm talking about things like intelligence, which, of course, suggests decision-making ability. In other words, it, it made a decision to appear yes. to you or something like that. It, and and I, I would say even though I can't process you know that experience because I didn't have it. Right. Uh, my my own you know worldview here. You know, I, again, these are just thoughts that I'm I'm thinking as I'm listening to you. Uh, the fact that this may you know have had you know these personal abilities. That's probably a better way to say it. Right. Of course, doesn't rule out that there's a higher form that we would call God. Uh, and and I would agree that that this form, whatever it is, could appear godlike. In, in other words, all these. These thoughts that, that could be extracted from this, I would find not threatening, again, to a, a theistic uh, worldview. And since I accept a theistic worldview and, and I'm not a materialist, uh, I could look at you and say, hey, I, I really think you did have this experience. I don't think it was something, you know, flickering in your brain that wasn't working right or whatever, right. That, that you actually, you know, could indeed have this, but again, if, if you and I were, you know, we're, we're friends having a friendly debate, you know, over at a, at a, over a cup of coffee or something, I would say, hey, you know, you know, maybe you ought to fit this into a theistic worldview. Well, let me. Uh, that's the way to I, break would, a train I would of thought. process it. But it, to me, it is a mystical experience because mm -hmm. I didn't no do any religious. Uh, uh, I didn't pull anything religious out of it at the time. It's still. A, it's still had that effect on my perception of my world as I see it. Mm -hmm. And I cannot, it, it, I can tell you what I saw that defied physics, but I don't expect you to believe it because you were not there. You can't experience right. it the way I did. And so when I right. see my friend who had a, a seriously religious experience and it has made him a very religious person, I believe him up to a point, but I can never experience what he experienced. All I know is right. what I He's learned is that I cannot say anything too. for certain. Well, it, it, I think you probably could say one thing for certain, that you're not a materialist. I mean, it, it seems to me that this experience yanked you out of that category. It, you're right about that, absolutely. Um, and, and I think, again, that, again, if we were... If we were, you know, pals at the coffee house, I would say that that's a great, that's an excellent place to start. And, and Art, this is a really good segue for your, your earlier question about UFO stuff. Yeah. People are not wasting their time to think again. I, and I'm I'm referring to what I call serious ufology here. I love going to UFO conferences, and I have I have colleagues in academia that ask me, "What in the world are you doing?" You know, what are do you they are you do doing? they love you, Mike? <laughs> if they're patient enough to hear me out, yes. <laughs> ah. huh. But I mean, I, I tell them, look, the the people that that listen to you know, shows like, like this, you know, like Dark Matter and, of course, you know, Coast to Coast and other shows, I mean, and go to these UFO conferences and are into this. I have found, my experience is that they are the most predisposed to having really good big-picture question discussions, which ultimately, you know, fall into the religious category. You know, who are we? Why are we here? Is there a God? All this kind of stuff. And I, I found a lot more predilection to really getting into you know, discussions of some depth in that area more so than church. I mean, that's just me. You know, I, I just, I like going to those things for that reason. People really like to talk about this sort of stuff. Oh, they do. Um, very quickly, Rick is um, asking, what are your thoughts on the camp of thinkers that claim there is no free will? We have very little time here. I, I disagree. I think we, if we do not have free will, we cannot image God. 
that's an attribute we, we share with him. 